Thank you. Uh, this is the regular meeting of October 24th to the Sayo Township Board of Trustees, now called to order. Uh, after we call the roll, we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance. Hathaway? Present. Palmer? Absent. Clintoft? Present. Brazo? Absent. Carey? Present. Noel? Present. Riser? Present. We have quorum. Thank you. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> this brings us to adoption of the agenda. I know there's one change. Uh, we're moving. Um, item G6, um, that's Woodview Commons Development Agreement Collateral Assignment from the Consent Agenda to New Business. Are there any other changes to the agenda? So G6 will be third under New Business? Well, we don't change the lettering. I'm with you. Okay. Um, Trustee Kerry. Yeah, I have, um, there's, I just have some questions about some of these on the consent. Do we need a bullet or? Yep. If you want to discuss them, yeah. Yeah, okay, um, absolutely. Uh, the G3, sorry, I'm, I scribbled all over this, so. Um, okay, G5. Okay, and. Okay, so well, and then G6 is what we just pulled, so that's it. Okay. For me. Okay. Um, and Bill, could I propose the order be J1, J2, G6, G3, G5? And that would accommodate the people who are here? Sure. So it'll be J1, J2, G6, G3, G5. G5. Okay. okay. Are there any other changes? Is someone prepared to move? I agenda? would move the uh, consent agenda. Well, no, no, wait, just the whole agenda. This I would move the, the agenda. agenda is adopted, amended, yeah. So moved by Riser. Support. Support by Flintoff. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The agenda is approved. This brings us to communications to the board. Is there any comment on the communications? I'll just know we've got several this weekend aren't yet included, but they'll be included in the next packet. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, that brings us to public comment. Uh, this is a time for members of the public to speak for up to three minutes on any matter under the purview of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Trustee Reiser, will you serve as our timekeeper, please? Sure. Um, we first hear from those who are present um, in the hall, and then we turn to those who are participating remotely. Um, is there anyone present who would like to speak during public comment? If so, please approach the table, have a seat. Gently breath a concerned resident. Um, I wanna make comment about uh, Carter's commercial, also known as the old Panera bread. So in some of their arguments, I'd like to finish one of their sentences for them. They state, we can't rent this property unless it has a drive-through. And I wanna finish that statement to say, at the price we are charging. Certainly they can rent the prop, the, the property, but not at the price they would like to attain. So why is it that Silo always bails out business owners and developers to make a higher profit? And we never give homeowners the same benefit. For example, if a homeowner said, I can't sell my house for this much money if I can't put in a screened, screened in deck in my backyard due to variance. Silo does this regularly. A good example is the property at Liberty in Wagner. Uh, approval for an office building. A couple of years later, he, the gentleman comes back and said, I can't sell it as 
office space. So I want you guys to bail me out and let me um, make very expensive rental units. We are not responsible for businesses, the risk they take. Um, and this is a classic example. And then another topic I want to uh, talk about, um, Arborist Groves. I've, I've been thinking about this lately. And this board by resolution sent the site plan back to the planning commission. You folks did that. That was, you set policy. That was a resolution. And the planner, Doug Lewan, refused to follow the board's direction by never putting the site plan on the planning commission's agenda. You gave direction, our planner refused to present it. I'm concerned that the township subjects itself to litigation by a private party by not enforcing its own resolution and policy. How can we have Carlisle Wortman deciding not to put that on the agenda? I think there's a problem in there. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'll try to be pretty quick since uh, a few things on the agenda. Um, first off, looking forward to the special meeting on 12 2 for uh, our strategic planning. It's very, very important. It's going to be crucial to moving everything forward. Um, one <laughs> question on J2, uh, Mr. Bailey, thank you very much for coming up with the plan. I guess I see there's an appropriation or a budgeting item for it, but it doesn't specify who's doing all of this work. Um, uh, I did see there's the new RFP section of the website, so that would be awesome if that was posted on there or if there's more information available at, about that. Um, and I did see that the audit uh, services proposal was up there, so that is awesome to see. Um, we do have an election coming up. I encourage people to come out and vote and support the fire department and the fire services assessment. I know there is a lot of information out there and there, there was a couple of beans that chief held where he answered a lot of questions for the community. I was at both of them and there were some people that uh, were surprised at the answers they got that weren't nearly as scary or off-putting as initially reading without understanding everything could be. So appreciate everything. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much. Anyone else present who would like to speak during public comment? I've got a quick question. I'm trying to access our packet online right now. The board yeah, meeting has been of, removed. <laughs> that's just, um, it's because the meeting has started. I'll send you the link. Okay. It's a quirk I've never figured out. Okay. And, um, let's turn to those who are participating remotely who would like to speak. Uh, Pam Lloyd. It'll be okay. Okay. Ready? Thank you. Uh, uh, Trustee Riser, does that mean you're running Zoom today? Oh, Chris Bailey is right now. If he leaves, oh. then, I'll, then okay. I'll take over for him. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, we, were, we weren't getting the audience when the audience was speaking. Oh, sorry. My bad. Pam Boyd, an, an active and informed res, Cyro resident. Uh, one, as a resident who represented concerns at the previous uh, planning commission meetings regarding the drive through at the old Panera, I would like to now add my support behind the project and ask the board to please approve this drive through. Uh, Joe Maynard and Curtis made several safety changes and took uh, commissioners and residents concerns to part. <clears throat> Kathleen, you brought up some good points. If this property wasn't right by the highway, I I would have uh, been, might have had a different opinion. Um, two, thank you for the December 2nd special meeting I see that's on the agenda. I hope you have a schedule uh, in 2024 for more of these. And three, um, SIO Community News YouTube channel has both of the links to Chief Hood's information meetings. If anyone listening to this would like to replay those, those are available online. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Jonathan uh, Greenberg. All right, he's unmuted. Hey, folks. Hey, Jonathan. Did we lose him? Oh, there. Oh. Jonathan, do you have anything to say? Through Ethernet. And I was trying to figure out, would it make sense to do that or make Jonathan, can you start again? We just, we were having trouble hearing you. Can you start over? Oh, um, probably not, not nearly as well as I just did, but I'll try. Okay. Um, so I, I was just talking to Chris. I was looking through the budget that he had put together for the much, 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 much needed um, overhaul of <laughs> IT infrastructure within sio township hall it's totally appropriate totally needed and, and by the way congratulations for keeping it so low i guess the only question i have is based on the cost of the cabling and the um cable removal would it might make the be more fiscally make more sense to um you uh, put in a advanced wi-fi mesh for network connectivity and only wire places that absolutely need you know, cat six wiring for security or what other other reasons, but it, it just seems to me like that would be less expensive. Having said that, um, um, I haven't done this in a while, so I'm just tossing out there as an idea. Um, can you? How about if you address these questions during your presentation okay. to the board? Right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hey, appreciate it. Everyone, have a good night. <laughs> Is there anyone else? <laughs> I uh, know that is it. All right, then let's move on to approval of minutes. We have one set of minutes. This is from the regular meeting of October 10th, 2023. Are there any corrections, additions to the minutes? Uh, None. I would uh, move the approval of the minutes. Moved by Riser. I'll support by Noel. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? <clears throat> the minutes are approved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that brings us to the consent agenda as modified. So the consent agenda is um, G1, G2, G4, G7. The other items having been moved to new business. Is someone prepared to move the consent agenda? I would move the agenda other than those pulled. Okay. Uh, motion by Riser, support by Noel. Uh, we'll need a roll call vote, please. Hey, per, per our rules of order, we're starting with Riser tonight. Riser? Right. Yes. Hathaway? Yes. Lintoft? Yes. Carey? Yes. Noel? Yes. Motion adopted five to zero. All right. Brings us to reports. Um, are there any comments on reports? Oh, please go ahead. Um, the, the first is I want to thank um, Plant Moran for their work on the corrective action plan. Um, they drafted pieces for Donna and me, and we'll be reviewing them, um, finalizing them, and we will um, send that out once it's all finalized to the board. It is due to the state by October 31st, but it won't come before the board typically doesn't, unlike the deficit elimination plan, which we're considering tonight. Regarding um, elections, I wanna give an update, if I could, <clears throat> on the November 7th election to make sure everybody knows what the next steps are. There's a map of the precinct and polling places up there. Um, want to invite everybody to the election commission meeting Thursday, 10 a.m. in this room. We'll be doing the public accuracy test of the tabulator. Uh, for the November 7th election. And beginning at 8 a.m. on Saturday, this Saturday, October 28th, we're starting early voting. So 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., Saturday, October 28th, through Sunday, November 5th, 8 to 4 in this room, any precinct in Sio Township can vote early, can vote here. So nine days of early voting here. 
Um, also want to let people know the clerk's office will be open this weekend and next weekend. Um, if you need to register to vote, you can register to vote. There's no deadline. They can register to vote up until 8 p.m. on election night. Um, if you want to get an absentee ballot, um, just come on in with a photo ID. You can get an absentee ballot. You can vote it here, take it home. Um, there's still time. And just want to encourage everybody to vote if you want to vote on election day. Um, the precincts are open as usual from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, changed for this election is we've consolidated precincts eight with three so that precinct eight is voting at WISD and precinct two, which normally votes here, um, is voting at Kiwanis Club with precinct four. All those voters have been notified. Um, we're doing that to consolidate down to six precincts and at four locations on election day. Jillian. So November 6th, there's no there, voting in Township Hall. Right. right. Early voting is from Saturday, October 28th through Sunday, November 5th. And it will be like that for the presidential primary as well. On Monday, November 6th, up until 4 p.m., you may come into the front of Township Hall and get an absentee ballot and vote it there. But there's not technically early voting on that Monday. That will be true for early voting going forward um, because practically um, everybody um, needs that day to conduct some other okay. steps before election. Interesting. <laughs> but so, um, in terms of ballots, we've issued 3,540 absentee ballots. Um, so again, it's a small election, but I have to say it's a small election, but more people are voting than ever before. So for a single issue special election, this will be by far the best turnout we've ever had, which is good. Um, so we've issued 3,540. We've gotten about 38% of those back, um, 1,350 ballots back. Um, we've had, you know, three people from overseas vote and expect more of those. On election night, um, polls will close at 8 p.m. As always, we'll be closing down three absentee voting counting boards. We'll close down the early voting site. And we'll close down the six precincts. So we'll have 10 tabulators each reporting results directly to the county. Those report directly to the county and they put them right on the website. So if you're interested in knowing the results of Tuesday's election as quickly as possible, there's two ways to do that. One, you're welcome to hang out with me here at the receiving board um, where all the returns will be coming in. Um, and people do, it's certainly public. I'm sure you know the campaigns on both sides will be there. Um, two, you can also tune into the um, county clerk's website. It says election results, and they'll actually, you'll see the numbers updating. So there'll be 10 updates as those 10 tabulators report results. You can just wake up on November 8th and look. <laughs> yes. But I just want to thank everybody. We have 80 inspectors working this election, about a dozen, dozen staff members. So I want to thank everybody. Um, for their help. Thank you. Are there further Are there any questions, questions for the for the election? Okay. Thank you. Did you have other items you wanted to speak to? Nope. Are there other comments on other reports? I saw we had a late arriving report on planning commission. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Looks like you guys had a good meeting. I had a question. Um what's why was the What's up with the Honey Creek PUD? It's on, it's on hold. I just, well, I don't, I don't know because I haven't been at the pre-meetings, but it, I don't think it's just, it's just not ready yet. No, okay. I don't know if Mariah's been there, but you know. Oh, and I don't need you, but at the planning commission, it just wasn't ready. It just, it just, it wasn't ready for prime time. Okay. So we didn't really discuss it much. Although they gave a little presentation. There were some Q and A. They knew it was going to be tabled from the get. Oh, okay. So, okay. So it was kind of a, <laughs> it was a kind of a trial. Why run. was it on the agenda? I, I don't 
No, but it was okay. <laughs> and we spoke about it a little bit and it got pulled and I, whatever we did, I wanted to report to this by. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and uh, we may have an opportunity for you to comment further on the other item that was dealt with uh, when we get to it, which is after reports. Curtis? Curtis commercial. But yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I don't I, I, I don't need to read my report. You folks see what it says and it'll make its way. I sent it to uh to, to Christine, it'll make its way. Yeah, Ultimately, yeah. I also sent it to Pam. I have a um written copy if anybody in the audience wants it. Um okay. So all right. It, and it was tabled it, to a date uncertain. No date, it was just table. We'll yeah. remove it from the table when it's ready to be discussed again. You're talking about the Honey Creek. That's office right. Part yeah. Of okay. Planning uh, Curtis was acting on and it's here tonight. I just want to make sure we're, we're everyone's clear. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, unless there's further comments or questions, um, let's move on to unfinished business. Um, this item I-1, this is possible action on CU number 23009. Curtis Commercial, mixed use, drive through restaurant. And um, we have uh, quite a bundle of materials related to this. Some of them were late arriving because we made kind of an exception and expedited uh, consideration of this item or reconsideration of this item without the minutes. So we have uh, a memo from Carla Wartman that was produced uh, today to summarize the actions by planning commission. And Laura's here. And Laura is available to answer questions. Um, she's participating remotely. Uh, it's Laura Kreps from Carla Wardman. Um, we also have the actual conditional use permit. Um, should the board choose to move forward this evening, we have that as well. Uh, and we have with us the applicant. So uh, why don't we turn it over to the applicant to make the presentation. I'll be brief. First of all, thank you for allowing us to present today, the day after the planning commission meeting. Um, my name is Jim Curtis and uh, David Curtis, a senior member of our management team and our family are the owners of our property located at 5340 Jackson Road. We started this process over a year ago and we're hoping today that we will gain approval. Uh, to my left is Joe Maynard from Washington Engineering, who uh, will uh, bring up the, the key points. Uh, most of it is a repeat from the last time that we were here uh, over a month ago. Um, and I do have just a couple of comments later on, but I'll leave that for Joe to finish up and I'll get my comments. But thank you. Um, I actually didn't get Laura's letter, but um, as you know, last time when we presented this, I didn't bring the whole presentation this time. I just saw it a couple of weeks ago. Um, pedestrian safety, um, you now have with you the traffic impact assessment indicating that the site um, would only see a 3% uh, increase in traffic. Um, also with us tonight um, online, um, we have our traffic engineer, Jacob, Swanson, the police in Vanderbrink, uh, available as well. If you have questions regarding the traffic, back studies available for questions and answers. Um, and as we talked about, um, we included all the improvements that were requested by the traffic impact for pedestrian safety. Um, realized during the planning commission meeting, we actually missed one sign. Um, which is the one right before the entrance to the drive through at the back. Um, we said we would gladly add that, and that was a condition of the planning commission's approval. Um, uh, other condition, I'm sure you know, is EV stations. We had the site prepped and ready for EV, with placing the conduit in the ground. We contacted DTE to confirm that the power was available for those EV charging stations. Um, either four uh, level two or one two station level three. Um, and then the last one was the condition that the planning commission um, placed on the approval for only allowing uh, fast casual. Um, one thing that we've realized is there's no real good definition for fast casual. <laughs> and that condition really kind of that's a hindrance on leasing the space, as I'm sure Jim can go into more than I can. 
um, with having to go through an approval process and everything. Um, that's one of the other reasons we asked the traffic engineer to be on board with us tonight as well. Maybe when we get into discussion to go over you know, the use of this project and why a true full fast food really wouldn't work anyways. And maybe the condition is just too much um, for this type of a project. So at which condition might be too much? Having a condition to make this only fast casual. Okay. Um, so so <coughs> the, the model motion. I, the I see that. In my report, I uh, did a footnote and addressed fast casual yeah. and where it came from. And I gave some examples that I was able to find of what some people regard as fast casual. I don't know if there's an official list, but I did some digging around into it and I included it in my uh, footnote of my report. So, Joe, I just want to make sure I understand, are, is, is it uh, a request from the applicant that that condition somehow be adjusted by the board? Mm -hmm. or, well, it's our understanding that the board makes the decision and right. you have the choice to either include it or have it excluded from the approval tonight. You'd yeah, like us to exclude it is what you're saying. I'd like you to consider it, yes. Yeah. Is there further presentation? Or? No, I, that was everything. I was trying to keep it short for you. Okay, great. Thank you. It, the other recommended condition was all signage recommended by the traffic impact study. Yes, we, we added everything. It was just the one sign at the entrance that I, okay. I forgot to get on the plan there. So that will be added. Professor Trustee Reiser, I'm curious if you what your thoughts are on this question of uh, modifying the motion by removing that condition. So here's what I found. Fast casual is a land use described in the Institute of Travel Engineers trip generation manual. And it's like frequency of trips that you're likely to have. The restaurants generally offer sit down service, but without wait staff or table service. Customers typically order off a menu board, pay for food before the food is prepared and seat themselves. And looking online for examples of fast casual restaurants, I found Panera, Chipotle, Culver's, Five Guys Burgers, Qdoba, Panda Express, Potbelly, Shake Shack, Einstein Bagels, Boston Market, and Blue Blaze Pizza, uh, among others. There were others that I found too. So it's, I don't know, it's like a maybe a step up from fast food, but I don't want to insult fast food either. So, so I don't know, maybe it takes a little longer um, to get them. So uh, I guess... It was added by uh, Chair Culbertson, and, 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 and there was a, a question that Stacy Maki was asked about whether or not mm -hmm. if it were fast food versus fast casual, and, and Stacy Maki opined, OHM, I don't know if she's here, that it wouldn't be a significant difference if she is. I don't want to speak for her, uh, but we can get her. Or if Laura Krebs wants to weigh in on that, Laura was present in the hall uh, when that was discussed. So... Um, you know, I, I'd want to hear, frankly, from uh, the Curtises as to what they've, what efforts they've done over the past six months, eight months, twelve months, however long, to try to sell this to various restaurants of any size or any style. It, 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 you know, I, I'm open to fast food, fast casual, without without restriction. But you know, do what this body, you know. I don't have strong opinions. I, I'd want to hear from the applicant more about, about how it ties your hands or not. Can I ask one clarifying question yeah, first? Yeah. Um, what was the purpose of um, Jan adding the fast casual? Because their traffic the intention. Because I think Panera was fast casual. So they started out with fast. I mean, I, I didn't commission their traffic impact assessment by call traffic study. So I, I'd want to hear from them. Uh, Panera was fast casual, and I think they said, okay, fast casual was here, and they started with a fast casual, but I can't speak for why they plugged in fast casual as a use, a land use. Uh, maybe the Curtis's or Mr. Maynard know that. Well, one of the reasons we, we went with that type of uh, layout is it's the drive-through configuration. So if you look at higher use restaurants, McDonald's, for example, they have multiple drive-throughs, multiple windows. Mm -hmm. You can order in two locations, you pull up, you pay at one window, pull up, you get your food at the next window. It's designed to move cars through very rapidly. Our configuration has one order location, menu order location, 
and one window where you would pay and then get your food. So it's designed to be a slower turnover just in the way that it's set up. It's, it's not going to be useful for one of those restaurants. They're not going to go here because it's not going to meet their needs. Like a Chick-fil-A couldn't go there. Well, yeah, Chick-fil-A would need six lanes, you know, or something crazy. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be marketed to the right use yeah. based on the drive through that's proposed. That yeah. restaurant's going to want that type of a drive through so yeah, those are very popular now. Uh, trustee Kerry. Oh, yeah, and I sat in or on Zoom listening to the meeting. And um, yeah, so regarding the fast casual, so I started thinking about it. Well, I've been thinking about it since last night, but you know, just the different fast, fast casual restaurants that actually have drive-throughs. Well, Panera is a fast casual, but they ditched out to build a building for drive-through. So, I mean, it is possible, but most of like the KFCs, the only time I've seen them with a drive-through is when they're combined with the Taco Bell. Um, so, I, I mean, I am open to, I want to, I would love to see um, either some type of food establishment, if it's a grocery store or whatever, because we need more of that, especially if we're going to have more um, dense residential along the plan for the future. So I, I'm open, but um, just it's it's you're kind of in a precarious position because you've got the banks, you've got the um, the agreements with the banks and and whatnot. So you, I'm curious. Um, that, do you anticipate sort of, sort of um, adapting the single window to allow for faster service? Um, I know, for example, Culver's. Um, sort of stacks people um, after they've placed their order and paid for it, they sort of, they send them off to sort of a waiting area and then they walk the food out to them. Do you anticipate that kind of use in the site? Not, at all. not, not from our perspective. It could be from the restaurant tour. Uh, during the pandemic, people did whatever they had to do in order to survive. Uh, so to answer that question, it all would depend on the circumstances mm -hmm. that a restaurateur would have at the time where they would take whatever measures were necessary to uh, uh, help their customers uh, obtain the food that they that they would like. Your site plan's not laid out like, like that, though, is it? it, is, it that's that's your, the intention of your site plan is you order back, and then it takes a while. Then you you pay for the food, and you, it takes a while for it to, to go from the order point. You're going to queue up a few cars between you get there, correct? And so That's you're like, your food's likely to be ready given the queue. That's right. Yeah. Our our, our stacking uh, lane that Joe has created uh, with the pre-stacking distance that we have is almost 300 feet. In part because one of the planning commissioners when we met early on suggested that he wasn't fond of having drive-throughs that are visible from the front. And we do agree with that. It, it's a beautiful building from the front. It will be more attractive as more uh, greenery is installed. Mm -hmm. But by putting in the back, uh, uh, gave us the opportunity to have the, the, the knowledge that there's no other drive through that has so much linear distance. Mm -hmm. So there's not going to be an issue with not only the issue that was raised uh, of how long it takes to order and then have one lane where you pick up your food and pay, but also this the, the stacking area is very significant to not create a bottleneck of any kind. Um, uh, and so that is why we are requesting that it just be uh, a uncategorized as far as specified and limiting the potential for this property to be used as we hope it will be. The other thought is that the building is 5,000 square feet. It's a very big building for a restaurant and there could be i'm not saying there will be but there could be a use by somebody who traditionally might have had uh, a, a fast food restaurant but wants to have more table sit down uh, occupancy and it beckons us because the building is not your traditional drive-through that's 2,000 square feet it has to be used because it's of value and it's of expense so uh, we're hoping that that change can be made on the application yeah, I have a. I'm looking at the model motion in Laura Krepp's um, memo. And Mariah, I don't know if you have that too. I hope. 
Yeah, if, if Laura and Stacy could um, join as panelists, please, Stacy, if you're there. Um, but my question is more for um, Mariah. Um, and just to remind the board that what we would be doing tonight is approving a conditional use permit. So process wise, I just want to flag again, um, we were getting better, better at this. I know it's kind of an unusual situation, but again, I want to have the full conditional use permit in the packet when we're approving it. So draft it up. So just for our own to, to flag that we're not doing that tonight. So what I'm working from for the language that we would need to enforce for all time, um, looking at this, I just want to get our township attorney's quick review on the um, conditions to make sure that those, oh, there? Yes. Yeah, no, I did it. I can give you one if you need it. Uh, oh, okay. no, Will has something else. He's got the conditional use permit. Yeah. Okay, where was that? It came late. It sort of followed that memo. Right Wait, did, did she email it? it? Yeah, yeah. It was it was emailed out today. France so there's a out. draft. Is it? Is it? Uh, that's the memo. So what memo. Will's looking at is a draft conditional use permit that we would. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. You thought, it's okay. Right. Um, but what's important is the conditions listed are the same as the conditions listed in this memo. So on the conditions, if I'm thinking ahead to five years from now, and we have a question about enforcement, well, is the restaurant used limited to fast casual as defined by the traffic impact study? Um, might there be something more permanent that we cite rather than the traffic impact study? Is there a... Does the traffic impact study have a specific definition of yeah. fast casual? Can I, 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 perhaps would like to speak if it's if it's appropriate. Please, please, Laura, speak. Yeah, put on put on your camera. Say hello. No. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I was out late last night, so I'm gonna sit comfortably here tonight. Um, ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, has a definition of fast casual restaurant and a definition of fast food restaurant. Okay, so and what that is, is called what, the Institute of what? The Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, this is what, you know, I'm not an engineer, but this is what these traffic impact assessments, these are categories of use that they use to do their traffic impact assessments. And so there is a differentiation between a fast casual restaurant use and a fast food use. Um, from that definition, I'm just going to read it to you. A fast casual restaurant is a sit down restaurant with no or very limited wait staff or table service. A customer typically orders off a menu board, pays for food before the food is prepared and seats themselves. The menu generally contains higher quality made to order food items with fewer frozen or processed ingredients than a fast food restaurant. Most patrons eat their meal within the restaurant, but a significant proportion of the restaurant sales can be carry out orders. A fast casual restaurant typically serves lunch and dinner. Some serve breakfast. A typical duration of stay for an eat in customer is 40 minutes or less. Um, fast food casual, like John said, is like Panera, Chipotle, uh, Shake Shack. Whereas a fast food restaurant includes a drive through window always. Um, this type of restaurant is characterized by a large drive through and carry out clientele, long hours of service, some are open for breakfast or all hours, 24, um, and high turnover rates for eat in customers. The restaurant does not provide table service. A patron generally orders from a menu board and pays before receiving the meal. A typical duration of stay for eat in patron is less than 30 minutes. Fast food is like McDonald's, Taco Bell, Wendy's. So there are definitions. Um, and I think the differentiation here is that although you're allowing a drive through, the primary fast casual restaurant use is for um, carry out and dining in with some proportion of drive through. And that's what the traffic impact study was based on was a limited um, fast casual dining uh, scenario. And so that I think is where this fast casual came from and why the planning commission felt it was important 
to have it as a um, have a, as a condition of approval. So Laura, would it be um, fair then to tighten up that first condition if we said the restaurant use is limited to quote unquote quote fast casual end quote as defined by the Institute of Transportation Engineers and appearing sure. in the accompanying traffic impact study? Sure. Okay, just for all time, five, 10 years from now, right? Travels with the land. Okay, and then do we typically, or should we in this case, um, include any, I, I guess it's a question for Laura, like by what point in time do the EV chargers need to be installed? The, um, well, the planning commission talked about having two um, installed immediately or when they intend to do their site plan work. Um, and that could be now, or it could be at some time when they get the user. Right. Um, but then to have, depending on the level that they choose, they have to have either four level two or two level three, I believe. So if yep. they did level three right away, then they would, they would um, meet their, meet their commitment, their condition. So if they did two level three, they'd meet their commission now. And what if they do four level two? We don't have any outer timeline for chargers three and four. No, they want. They just wanted the prep work completed. They want two immediately, like when they open and then prep work for two more at some point in the future. They did not give a timeline. But for a conditional use permit. Yes. Condition, wouldn't it be appropriate to have some sense of when the final chargers would be installed? Uh, well, well, if we had a user, yes, but at this point, there's no user. There's no tenant. I'm just thinking oh. ahead to, and, and really, this is not about your project in particular, but we just got schooled in conditional use permits mm -hmm. and not considering them, you know, um, carefully enough when we're writing them. Um, so, Joyce? Well, I was just going to state, you know, the prep work, I think, is important so that you know exactly, you know, where they're going to be located. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the question I would have for the uh, owner is whether there's any objection to doing that and if there's a time frame that would work for you. Yeah. Well, we already said that we're willing to uh, put in the, the rough and wiring and have them in locations in the front of the building which was uh, very satisfactorily received by the planning commission rather than the, in the back. Uh, and it was added to install them. And of course, we don't want to install anything until we have a tenant because there's not a tenant there. We haven't uh, found anyone that has been willing to take the space. Uh, so we may, be at, we may end up being the first uh, either fast casual or fast food uh, location in the township that will have EV stations. Wouldn't that be interesting? And as an example for the future, uh, so regarding EV stations, um, uh, we have uh, agreed uh, uh, to accept the recommendation of the additional condition of installing EV stations rather than just the wiring. Uh, it's pretty much the question here of the definition of the product that we are able to have at that location. Uh, that is whether it be fast casual or fast food. And given the limitation of uh, the single lane and single bay for pay and to receive, uh, given the extraordinary length of the uh, stacking area and the pre-stacking area, and just as importantly, the size of this building beckons a significant percentage of the building to be used for sit down as opposed to drive through, because it's it's not what you would find traditionally with four lanes of drive through. So, where that's our only consideration or concern, if you will, so that it gives us flexibility to be able to attract a tenant. Um, with the way it's drafted right now, there are uh, significant limitations. Uh, to be frank, and uh, and was asked earlier, you know, wanting to hear where we stand and where what we've done so far. And we began advertising this building well over a year ago. David and his sister, who are senior members of our company, reached out to nationals, regionals, and locals. And uh, the, the, the vast majority of the responses, however few there were, related to, well, do you have a drive through so it, it's, in, it, you know, we are in an area there, if I may say, that is a, a car destination area. That's why you have all these dealerships there. And there aren't any houses next to this property. It's not where people walk from their apartment or their condo. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a 
uh, destination by a vehicle. So we're hoping that that could be that, that could be changed. So, thank you. Um, so I'm still not understanding the second sentence of number two. Laura, a minimum of two stations are required to be installed with the remaining to be prep work for any remaining stations to be completed. I don't understand what that means. So, so the full, so it says either four level two or two level three charging stations to be provided. Right. They, the planning commission wants a minimum of two that are required to be installed now um, when they when they when they put the drive through in and any remaining so if they were to do four two they would want the remaining prep work completed for the remaining two if they're just putting in um, the two level three they want those put in at the time they put the drive through in I'm sorry I listen, but that's that was so the little okay so John do you agree that's what the second yeah, sentence yeah, says yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't can you make it say that since you were there, it says it. What it says, Laura, it's. I, I got it here. A, a minimum of two Thank you. charging stations are required to be installed at the time the drive-through site work is com is being completed. The okay, remaining, the you know, then if they don't do the level three stations, the prep work for the two remaining level two stations would have to be completed at that time as well. You could and say future installation. You could say any remaining because any sure. Yeah. Because yeah. any would apply to two, but any wouldn't apply to three. Right. Yeah. So so okay, so this is good. I just want to get this potential edit down. Um, a minimum of two stations are required to be installed at the time the drive-through site work is to be completed. Period. Yes. Okay, next sentence. Keep going. Any remaining stations, the the prep work for any remaining stations would need to be completed at, at that time also for future for future EV charging. The prep work for any remaining stations would need to be completed at that time as well. Yes. So Laura, Laura awesome. I think I think this leaves a question kind of hanging. So mm -hmm. if there are two prepped EV stations that are completed, when when is the is it anticipated that they will be completed? So I so I think the plan John can correct me, but I think the planning commission was trying to get um at least two EV stations completed when they do the site for the drive through. However, since they don't have a tenant, um, you know, they the planning commission was trying to give the owner additional time so the tenant could put those in at a future date. There was no future date suggested by the planning commission. Because there's some discussion or debate or a decision point is whether you do the EV3 to accommodate customers or EV2 to accommodate employees. One's a longer, slower charge that you can do more of that employees are likely to benefit from. One's a, a quicker charge that you can't do as much because you can't get the energy from DTE and Joe can report more on how much energy you have. So it's, do you want your customers to eat there and charge or do you want some of that and some longer term stuff? And I think they wanted the flexibility as to what their tenant wanted, but I don't want to get and speak for, for those people. So. So the third sentence is the prep work for any remaining stations would need to be completed as well. Or would also need to be completed at that time or something. At yeah. that time? Yeah, at that time, whatever. Yeah, at that time. I, I think that would work. Uh, at that time. Yeah. Well, okay. and, then, and then the final sentence would be with the station, those stations to be installed once a tenant moves in. Right, occupies. Occupies. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that would be the third sentence. Yep, fourth sentence. Say it again, Will. Um, with the remaining stations to be installed when a tenant occupies the building or something like that. Is that fair for the applicant? You know, we're getting that, guys. So you want the other two when the tenant starts, or well, what's what's we're what's the uh, we're appropriate writing this point right here. Yeah. So. Right. so so what we 
proposed and but was added by the planning commission last night uh, what we proposed was that in the front of the building because one of the questions that was raised was where would these ev stations be in the southern part of the building uh, there's a handful more than a handful of parking spots uh, regular and also ada and we, we took some time to look at the building and to make sure that if there are two EV stations, that one of them should service ADA. The other should service regular customers. Now, whether or not we'll have three or two, I don't know yet. And the location uh, is though in the, uh, in the Southern elevation of the building on the, uh, on the Eastern side where we have both ADA parking spots and regular. Th that is what we proposed. And then the planning commission last night said, we want to make sure that you're not just giving us lip service. We want to make sure that it's done because apparently there have been instances where yeah. people have promised and not performed. Right. We have no problem with that. Uh, Joe has investigated with DTE to look at the transformer. And that's why Joe suggested what we can perform and provide based on the size of the trans transformer. Uh, and that still needs to be investigated, but we, we feel very confident uh, that we can have four uh, stations, uh, if you will, with the lesser power and three with more. So, uh, and as far as additional ones are concerned, we don't have a tenant. So talking about what the future will be before we know what the future is, is very difficult. But if that tenant would like to have additional EV stations for maybe more customers, perhaps their staff. Now, one of the comments that was raised was, uh, I think by the planning commission, to have all of the, um, the employees park in the very north of the building, the parking lot, furthest away from the building, and one of the recommendations was, was to have signage and to require us to ensure through leases that the tenant uh, insists that the that their employees park far away from the building. Well, it's hard to get power over there. So all of these questions are still in, in, in flux, but at least we're speaking in terms of the front of the building of what we are promising to install when the work is completed. We have to tear out all the sidewalks because they're not ADA compliant. They have too much of a pitch. Even the blacktop where the parking is, is, is not code because it's too much of an angle. So there's going to be a considerable amount of work here that has to be done. But as part of it, we thought it makes sense while we're tearing this all out to run the underground wiring. And with last night's recommendation to also insert that we insert them, we, we agree with that. That's not an issue. So, Mr. Curtis, I think what we're trying to get at in the, right. in the wording that we're, we're right. wordsmithing right. right now is the the way that it's written there's two stations that would be installed completely yes. at the time that you're doing all of this work to That's correct. put in and then there's the possibility Attention. for two more to have the wiring put in but to have the actual the prep work, the, yeah, the prep work done but that have the actual units put in at some later point contingent on having a tenant we're just trying to figure out That's a what toughie. that contingent, what how to define that yeah. point. It, it's a toughie because once you are finished with the stacking drive-through lane, because we want to get going on this without having a tenant, uh, you're going to have to destroy it again to bring wiring in the back of the building. So what we didn't know was that the planning commission wanted to have additional besides what we indicated we would do. The four and instead it, of the two? The, the 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 front in the front of the yeah, building, okay, and and that that makes sense to us because we're tearing it out already. Uh, what we didn't anticipate, and I have some objections to, is to anticipate what we may end up doing or not doing in the future. Right. So, and where that's going to be, it's 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 a slippery slope. You know, it's not where we don't want to commit, but uh, if you get started on a project and you have to tear it out to do something that somebody wants later on, uh, it, it's backwards. So where, assuming that you do four units that are the level two, um, mm -hmm. and so two of them are installed and two you're just doing the prep work for, where would you do the prep work? At the, That's at the, the question. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it could be in the middle of the parking lot. It could be where the employee parking is, which makes it harder the further you make a run electrically 
the bigger the wiring and the more power and transformers and so forth. So we know that the existing transformer can take care of what we're proposing in the front. Th that is a given. But you know by when? I'm sorry. Like the outer limit by when? I'm sorry, the, say that again. By when, when would you have the third and fourth uh, EV charger? Well, it, it, is it my understanding that you have the pole and you have the two wires from each one, right? You, you have you're servicing two you're servicing two uh, parking one areas. One unit serves two. Spaces. Right, right. And so when we talk in terms of four, we're not talking about four poles uh, uh, that are planted in the front of the building. The building there'd be two, and each one would have if it's uh, if it's uh, you know the degree of the elements that are permitted uh, or that we can have, there would be two cables coming from each pole. Does that make sense? Yes. Or is that so that's, that's what we that's what we proposed and are willing to do beyond what is required of us by 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 the by so this that we're proposing. Who knows about stations in in terms of the planning commission's condition that was placed? In, if if those two poles and each one has two wires going to two different cars, mm -hmm. that, then that, that is that four that's, stations. That's four stations. That's four stations. So you're planning to install something. That you just described, which would be four stations. Yes, if it, 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 get go. Uh, no, two. So four or two. One pole, two stick, two parking well, spaces. Yeah. So okay, so we'll start. All right. It's a little confusing. Sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm trying to follow what you're saying, but so what you're talking about is uh, initially you would install at least one pole with two wires coming off of it. Right. Yes. And if. And in order to, um, unless those were level three, um, you would still have to install the the prep work for an additional pole with two wires coming. Right. Our plan currently yeah. shows conduit going from along the front. That we could have two in the front. I think what Jim's getting at is the client the tenant may want those spaces in the rear. Um, but the conduit could be placed from two parking spaces over 20 feet, prep for another pole if it goes there as one option, but the tenant may want that in the back for their employee. We don't know. I guess, I guess, oh, sorry. Well, that's what I was, so the, the planning commission didn't say have some in the back of the the parking lot for the employees. They'd like the idea of it in the front, but they didn't say you had to be one place or the other. Okay, right. Okay. We're not, and that's not the purpose of it. And, and, and right. I will say this there's going to be Kitty Corner from here in Meyer, there's going to be uh, the, the Panera one. They're going to have some across the street. Down the street, we're going to have 12 level three at, um, at Lithia. So, so what what one of my concerns? It's not much of a concern, but it's a concern that they probably have. Is like I don't want to require more than the market can accommodate, or that there's a demand for. So I I want to make sure that there's two there now, and then conduit for future stuff. If you know, and and if they'll build it when there's demand for it, I'm okay with letting letting them build it when there's demand for it because they're gonna accommodate employees or accommodate customers when employees I think the hard part there. is and I think what I, I don't want to speak for you but I, my my sense of what we're trying to do here is to have conditional use uh, language that a future board no. years from now could or, interpret or, and install, or, or this board um, could in you know yeah. enforce if need be no, and I, if it's left wide open um, you know, they could say, well, yeah, we always intended to put in the, you know, second or third or fourth, whatever yeah. kind of station. And so, so let me come at this from a little different angle, because I, I agree with you, Will, that it, using a conditional use that travels with the land for something that is contingent on what a future tenant or something might do, it's awkward. Okay. Um, Mariah, um, and again, process point, Laura, Joyce, Mariah. Um, I know this one was rushed, but for every conditional use, I really want, you know, Mariah to have a chance to look at the conditions, to look at how enforceable they might be. Um, so be provided. Um, does that mean they can be in 10 years, not maintained, not working, not upgraded? 
Is this a one-time? It seems like fee provided, providing an EV charging station feels more like a one-time thing. How is it a condition that travels with the land? Mariah, kind of, um, you know, I'm not asking for any final opinion. I'm just saying if something's provided here, what does it mean in 10 years when we look back at this and 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 I I go, hey, you know, we don't even use the terms level two and level three anymore because the technology's changed. Um, but I'm I'm trying to look at this and figure out are they in compliance with this conditional use? Are they providing these? What does provide mean? Oh, install and maintain. I asked Mariah. Because <laughs> I want I want to, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good Offense. point. That, that yeah. this is to me, this is kind of an interesting thing to have in a conditional use permit. It feels a little more like site plan totally to me than it does conditional use. Agreed. Um, so you know, we're we're mixing two things together. I don't think it's a, a bad idea, but I but I agree with you that the language is complicated. Will this need to come back for a site plan review? Laura, this, this, this will not come back for site plan review because oh. they are not modifying the building. Right. So okay, so this is our this is our one chance to to put this is right. your chance, and that's probably why it's it appears that there are some site plan things, but that's because they are requesting modifications to the site as part of this conditional okay. use approval. It's a drive through. So, so Laura, historically in Sio Township, recent history. What other kind of utilities have we asked people to install and maintain as part of a conditional use? And Mariah, have you ever seen this in any community? Install and maintain a utility or something like an ED charging station via conditional use? Or is this new ground? I'm not aware of any. Okay. I've not seen it either. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying we should... There's a reason why we're having a, a little bit of a struggle with it. So, so it's an ongoing, so I would want an ongoing maintenance. I know it's a DTE. The EV charging station is something that is purchased. It will break, it will become obsolete. What is our expectation for this land? Well, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yeah. I guess I'm wondering with, um, the second condition related to the uh, charging stations at the very end where it states to be prepped for any remaining stations to be completed. I would finish that sentence as, as stated earlier uh, at the time that a tenant uh, is um, identified for the site. Okay, at the time that the tenant, at the time Identified or occupies? Uh, maybe occupied. The tenant occupies the site. Thank you, Joyce. Yeah. That's a good edit. Because I think that was the intent. Um, okay. That was good. And then what about maintenance, Joyce? As far as maintenance of the um, EV stations. The EV stations. I don't know if um, we need, I don't know if we need to, maybe I'd ask Laura that question, but I, I don't believe we've done that in other instances where it was required by the planning commission. But it's never been required through conditional use. I guess I'm just wondering, like yeah. it's a condition of the land. Like it's it's a conditional use that travels with the land. And what happens like if they, they sell? I, I'm, I, they sell it to another, they sell it to another restaurant in 50 years and they got to put an EV to, even though that's no longer a thing anymore. Right. No, no, I mean, and even like it's, it's provided, it's just, it doesn't work. What we want is ongoing. We're gonna have flying function, cars by then, right? We want ongoing function. You want it to be operation, operational. Operational. So can we say be horses. provided and can we add any requirement about it being operational, provided and operational? Well, I don't know. I I don't know any more than you do. This yeah. is new territory. Yeah. I was thinking about we have a tenant who's working on EV charging without wiring, and um, and. To, to maintain something that could be obsolete could be counterproductive. As Absolutely, a landlord, yeah. you know, as a landlord, you want to be current. And the things that we're proposing beyond what is required of us are current. They make sense. 
to do this. It's, it, it's good business practices to think ahead or be futuristic. And that's why we haven't objected to doing this. It makes sense to do this, even though there are EV stations so, that are gonna be popping up. But what would happen if they become obsolete? What happens if there's a, me a better method? And there probably will be. And so, uh, you know, from a landlord standpoint, we'd like to be current. We want to have the things that people want that attract people to be there. And I think it's at least a start to put in and putting it in the front to, to demonstrate that, yes, we are in belief a belief of this. Let's have this here and see what happens. It could be that we will tear up the, the, the stacking lane if we're permitted to have this and put more in the back. It's hard to say, but that, that, that is caused and created by, by what people you know, in the community want. And we certainly want to serve that. Well, I also think that, you know, there there is an opportunity for an amendment to a conditional use. Yeah, yeah that's so what I was wondering. What would know, trigger if that? It is, if it is obsolete, they could come to the board and say, hey, we've got this thing we've been maintaining because you requested that we would provide and maintain it, but no one's using these chargers anymore. As Will said, now we have flying cars. No one's using this. Can Can we abandon it at this point? And the township board could say yes. And would there so, be the option for the township board to open that up? Sure. Yeah. And you mean reach out to them and say, we don't need you to have that anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How, how about this? Um, it has to be by agreement. Remember by that. agreement. Sure. But they probably don't want to keep something obsolete. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Well, what about um, maintain the current standards or um, And what you were just saying as well, because if right now there's EV chargers, so to I think maintain holds maintain, it. Yeah, maintain to current standards. Um, and then maybe number four would be something about what you just. But but does what does maintain to current standards mean? Are you saying that they, if technology changes, they have to upgrade this thing? Well, yeah, because it would be obsolete. Yeah, well, or I, removed. That would have a new. That would re reopen the conditional use permit. I, I don't. I, 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 I empathize with what you're trying to accomplish, Trustee Carey, but I think it, there's only so far we could go um, in anticipating what the future holds in terms right. of Right. The then, or just take. But right now, what what you had brought up, Jess, is that um, level two or level three EV charging stations ten years from now. So. Have, do we just remove that and say? I think we could just say be provided and maintained. Right. Period. Or installed. And, and yeah. yeah. Well, installed <laughs> and maintained. In, yeah, it installed and maintained. Yeah. I, I, well, I think the key design. thing that the planning commission was trying to accomplish was to have the stations installed. Exactly. And I think maybe that's we, as we far as we should go. We heard um, that loudly and clearly, and we don't object to it. It makes sense to us. The difference here is it's a conditional right. land use, which right. will go with the land. Right. So that's where it gets a little dicey. It's well, not a community. I, I understand, but I think um, what we've what we've recognized is that the planning commission was basically doing something that's kind of a site plan element and in a conditional use just not you know, framework and and I think you know the installation yeah. of the of the charging stations is the key thing that we can count on and measure at this point anything else is sort of speculative maintained I think maintained is fair installed and maintained maintained in leases and it means to be operational Proper work in perpetuity, order. you know, to, to maintain to that, like the, the current EV stations that are there now to um, to maintain those, even if they become obsolete, would we then be required to maintain as antiques as representative? <laughs> you know, I don't know. We could argue we about that at the time. Yeah, yeah, right, if we put in maintain, we can argue about it. That's, that's right. right. Is, it, um, is so, it just, does it need to be in that. here that? Um, to come back for an amendment, or is that just a, a no, given with just it? by right? Oh, they, they have the right to come back and, and request yeah. an yeah. amendment, so we don't have to put it in there. Okay, just right. remember that. Could so, someone read it back? I think uh, mm -hmm. Clerk Flintoff has got the most complete notes. Sure, um, I, I'd uh, make the motion uh, that the township board approve 
CU number 23009 Curtis Commercial drive through Restaurant with a mixed use conditional use based on the recommendation of the Planning Commission with the following conditions, colon. One, the restaurant use is limited to quote, fast casual as defined by the Institute of Transportation Engineers and appearing in the accompanying traffic impact assessment. Two, that either four level two or two level three EV charging stations be installed and maintained period. A minimum of two stations are required to be installed at the time the drive through site work is to be completed, period. The prep work for any remaining stations would need to be completed at the time a tenant occupies the site, period. Number three, install all signage as recommended by the accompanying traffic impact study, period. Traffic impact assessment. I would second that. Um, so moved by Flintoff, support by Riser. Yeah, the only thing is the fast casual versus do we want to get rid of fast casual or do we leave fast casual? That that's the discussion. Yeah, so I, I there's a, at least there's a motion on the table. Yes, to discuss. Right. we have a motion to discuss. Is there further discussion or uh, speaking to that point, the definition yeah. of the, the condition of fast casual? I would be okay striking fast casual and let them get some. I don't think they're going to get a high volume restaurant based on. The, the design, but I'll defer to what the majority on this board wants to do. So when you did, you did bring up um, about the, the drive through and how it wouldn't accommodate like a McDonald's. So how is then already that just um, eliminates the fast food. So does that make a difference to have fast casual or? I went online. I was looking at uh, fast casual versus uh, fast food. It is so confusing. Some products or companies that are considered fast casual in one search uh, uh, will be the opposite in another search. It's, it's convoluted. And so what we're concerned about significantly is how do we attract somebody when we don't know who we can attract? The other thing that's important is that if there is a fast food entity that wants to now be fast casual, because our building is so big, it's twice the size of your typical fast food entities, someone would have to use that uh, area that is larger now for their sit down area. And talking to Laura uh, uh, perhaps earlier today, she threw out a statistic that traditionally a uh, fast casual would be 60% sit down, 40% drive through. I doubt very much we're going to have 40% drive through with one lane. But what by, by allowing it to be uh, a fast food designation, grants us the ability to attract somebody who may have been fast food, but now cannot be because they need to utilize the entirety of the building. So it, it, what we are um, strongly in favor of is having the ability to market the space and attract a tenant to occupy the space. Do we have a condition based on the traffic study? Like that's the, because you can only have so much traffic you know, and Lord, Lord did mention that, that, uh, that, that let's say there is a, a fast food entity that wants to be there. And she indicated certain ones that would not work, which we agree with. We wouldn't want them there. They would be a problem to be there. Um, she said, regardless, there would be the, uh, the elements that would have to be reviewed, such as hours of operation, number of employees, um, the percentage or estimate of the profits of that company, whether it be from sit down versus the drive through, those kinds of things, including traffic. So as part of the protective element to the township and to us, because we certainly don't want to bring in anybody that would cause an issue. After all, you own the building, you don't want to have hazards. So by even it being <laughs> fast food categorized, but that they still have, the township still has the mechanisms to enforce something that they would say is not appropriate. So we're, we're, you're safe that way and we are safe that way because there's going to be due diligence to this uh, with the fast food, de fast food designation. Does that make sense? Do you plan on having, do you plan on having 24 hour operations or operations past midnight? No, what we, uh, we, you asked me that question. I remember the first time we met. 
And I said, without knowing who would, well, I do because it was a proud, a significant question that I couldn't answer. Um, what I did say to you at that time was that uh, it, Panera opens at 6 a.m. They close, depending on the weekday or weekend, around 11 o'clock. I'm sure the staff is there till at least till 12. That is, that, that is typical for this area um, because it caters to the customer during those hours. Uh, we're not interested in having uh, a bar. Uh, uh, it, it could be a, a restaurant that does have alcohol that has people who want to pick up uh, their, their meals. But the, 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 the question I can't answer as far as the hours, but that is what we're thinking it'll be because that's what you're finding in this area. It's not Main Street downtown. It's different. This is a very different marketplace. Well, I think that the traffic alone, um, you have the traffic study and it limits how much traffic. So I, I would be okay if it was just open without the fast casual. How, how does it limit how much traffic there is? Because they've done the traffic study and the, that area will not um, handle or the building in the parking lot cannot handle like a McDonald's with a two or four lane drive through. But we don't know for sure. Right. We don't have any assurance. I mean, that's what we predict. But it still has to, when you have a tenant, you have to still come in front of the right. board. Laura said that board. if we have a prospective tenant, that the process is that we need to go before uh, the various organizations of the township for it to be reviewed. And she indicated it's between seven and 10 days. So there's this you know, to, to do re the review. Okay, I'm not clear. Yeah, what are, what are the board's next steps on this? I thought that there was no site plan coming forward. There, there, is there, is no, is. there is no site plan, but any tenant would need zoning compliance, which is where we would evaluate whether the user meets that fast casual or would um, meet the traffic right. study. So it's so, an administrative, administrative review by yeah. you, right? Yes, yeah. So... And so, Laura, um, you seem, you want to propose that if you weren't comfortable, um, you could assess when they come in to see if they meet the fast casual. Um, if the board were to strike that condition, how would you evaluate traffic if you didn't have that condition? I would utilize the traffic impact assessment that is on file with the conditional use approval. And I would also consult with the engineer if I was unsure about the use the tenant proposed. Um, I would also, I can also ask the tenant for their traffic um, data based on other sites to be evaluated at that time. So there are ways that we could do that. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think that there's going to be a tenant that wants to be here that is too, you know, too um, big or too um, intense for the site. But I think the planning commission just based on they asked for the impact study they originally denied it until they saw the traffic study um and then they wanted to limit the use to ensure that traffic impacts and pedestrian safety and um site circulation was adequate so i think okay those were all of the reasons that they they implemented that fast casual condition seems like there are good reasons that the planning commission put this in here so you would support keeping that condition of the fast I would. I can be persuaded. I just would want to know how we would <coughs> address those concerns, if not through this condition. Right. I, I'm with you, uh, Jessica. Well, I, uh, given that uh, we sent this back to the Planning Commission and, and asked them to give us guidance, I, I am inclined to stick with their condition as well. Are you, do you have, I mean, it sounds like you don't have concerns about being able to move forward. It's not going to hamper your business. I'm sorry to say that again. Do you have um, concerns that the limitation to fast casual would hamper your ability to lease? I do. You I do. do? I do. Possibly for near future down the line if definitions change. I mean, it just would pose some ambiguity going forward and perpetuity of what is what constitutes fast casual versus I, I would yeah. say that, okay. that primarily that because there's the avenue of assessing the viability of, of a fast uh, fast food uh, uh, status if you will 
prior to any approval. That is traffic studies, hours of operation, number of employees, oh, and, and many more things, of course, the traffic study. The, the township and we are all protected, but, it, but to answer your question, yes, I, it, would, it would be more detrimental to not have the fast food categorization versus fast casual. So we just spent time on condition one and what became a motion I just made that I thought defined fast casual, but I'm hearing you're saying it could change. It would be more difficult. It would be more difficult from the standpoint that you're eliminating something that wanted to change to being more fast casual if it were to be, or less intense uh, as far as the use of the building. I, I keep, I keep re reminding myself that we have a single lane uh, with, um, with one uh, bay window where people would pay and receive their goods. This is not a, uh, a fast food entity where you're attracting a Chick-fil-A or a Starbucks. We're, we're not interested in that, but it does provide the building greater flexibility to attract a tenant. But, but you could sell it. This conditional use would be in place and it could become something else without condition one. So the, if, I mean, and, and again, I'm just thinking uh, ahead. I think that's why it was probably put in there. Yeah, and the, the restaurant use is limited to fast casual as defined by the trap. So what if it's sure. a, a fancy restaurant that wants to go in? They have to say no because it's limited to fast casual. Well, I think part of the reason it was put in there, if I may say, in the in the uh, uh, Workman, um, paperwork was that, and I talked to Laura about that. Um, it said that I was in favor of uh, a fast casual, and when I spoke to Laura today, I said, "No, that's not what I said. We're, we're we want fast food. Would I would I like to have fast casual if I could attract fast casual? Of course." Mm -hmm. I wouldn't exclude them because Panera was a fabulous tenant of ours. And if we could replicate what we had, I would be thrilled. Mm -hmm. but, but what it does by leaving it at fast casual, it limits the ability of the building to attract a potential tenant that we can bring to the township, who then will assess through all of the parameters that the township has, thank goodness, to determine its viability and its safety and its 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 purpose in that area, whether it's viable. So, this the township is still very safe with this, but it allows us more flexibility to bring a prospect to the to the table to the township's uh, review. But Laura, what would you be evaluating at the zoning compliance point of view? At that point, it would simply be what. Well, so there is a definition of fast casual. That's what we're using from the Engineer Institute language. That's what the traffic impact study was. So I would be asking questions like, what are their hours of operation? That's typical for zoning compliance, right? What are your hours of operation? How many employees do you have? Um, what is the intensity you anticipate in the drive-through? Those are all things we can answer to ensure that they meet the conditional use um, conditions. Um, I just want to note to Jillian's comment about fine dining. Um, fine dining would be a permitted use. Um, so this conditional use would not apply to fine dining. This conditional use is for the drive-through use. So very unlikely that a, a fine dining establishment would want to continue the drive-through. So I have a question. So okay. Um, so fast casual is the use. What if McDonald's says we want to come in and we don't want to have a fast food McDonald's. We want to have a fast casual McDonald's where everybody comes in and they order and they sit down because we have a playhouse or because we have all kinds of amenities inside. Is it possible for a restaurant that we traditionally regard as fast food to come in and say, we're not going to have a fast food model. We're going to have a fast casual model because that's the use that we want at this site. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I was asking her, but I appreciate <laughs> Are you asking me? Yeah, 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 because I say it's not the name of the restaurant. It's the use of the restaurant. And we want yes, to have yes. it. I'm sorry. Yes, I would say yes. I mean, if they, if, yeah. if McDonald's came in and said, we are not going to do as intense drive-through operations. We're going to, we're not going to do breakfast. We're going to be open from, you know, 10 to eight. And, and we're going to focus on um, 
a fresher, fresher food and, you know, it's going to be completely different McDonald's, then yeah, I think that it would, it, that would meet the fast casual definite. If, if it meets the fast casual definition, then yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying I would get see a zoning compliance for a certain restaurant and say, well, that's, I mean, just, just say, well, I don't know that to be fast casual. I mean, there, I think there are other questions we have to ask to determine whether it meets that, that fast casual criteria and an evaluation of the drive-through usage by the, by the, by the engineer. So Laura, with this site in particular, um, the condition one, the restaurant use is limited to fast casual because to Jillian's point, I agree. Like I can imagine, I mean, with everything that changed in COVID, I can imagine, I mean, uh, uh, something like Carlisle, you know, having pull up everybody using apps. I mean, a lot of people are going through drive throughs not the two windows, not the old fashioned, everybody's changing their model and McDonald's looks a lot more like Panera every day. So um, Laura, what, what, how would I like, like a Carlisle grill as an example with a drive through could they be in this site? I, I can't answer that because I don't know what they're, I mean, they'd have to provide some information about um, their traffic and the intensity of the drive-through use. Um, that, that's what that's what this is tied to. So that um, restaurant use, you're just talking about the restaurant drive-through component. Yeah. yeah. So that's, maybe that's, that's what fine. we need to put in is oh, what she sure. just said, the drive-through use and the traffic. But to, to kind of, then that would open it up. To, but I mean, they're not, they're going to have to put butts in the seats or they're not going to make their rent. It's, they have to rent all that space. And I don't know that just whizzing people through the drive through is going to make the rent payment because it's just so much real estate. But I don't know that. And, and that's it, what that, if, if, unless I'm misunderstanding, that's what the conditional use permit is, is directly related to the drive through. Right, so the restaurant use, I think that's what threw me off. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so I was thinking can... about Carlisle because yeah, it's sure not the that... restaurant use, it's the restaurant or Metzger's drive be another use. Like a Metzger's could they? oh, we need a drive through to do our Red Reuben to go. They do need one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. But, yeah. but, but Jillian, I think number one is clear as is because it refers to the traffic. We know it's the restaurant drive through. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, I'd rather. I'm loath to change what the planning commission is and, and, thought through. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm gravitating toward that as well. To the extent that they can't lease it out in a six months or whatever, or they, they can come back and seek something else? Question mark. Yeah. Yeah. This is the condition we have that controls traffic. Right. Part of that decision, I, if, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think uh, was part of that decision based also on the fact that the traffic study was done um, assessing the change of what it is now, which is fast casual to just adding a drive through window. That's what the, that's what the assessment was kind of geared towards. And was that, was that somewhat uh, the basis behind um, the planning commission deciding to uh, play, put in place a, um, some kind of a, a um, a conditional uh, parameter for for fast casual only was was based on the fact that the re report that we provided was only assessing the increase of going from fast casual to just adding a drive through window. Um, you were there, and like, I was there. Seems like a question for Laura. Maybe. Right. Well, I, I'm happy to answer what I can. So I'm looking at page two of the fleece Vanderbrink traffic assessment that was provided by the applicant. Page two, first paragraph. It says the ITE land use fast casual Perrin LUC number 930 Perrin was determined to best represent the existing conditions of the site. So that's what they were determining using to determine. Um, it does go on to say that um, that this that IT does not have a land use that represents a fast casual restaurant with a drive through. So they use a fast food restaurant with a drive through um, for their for their calculation. But the the that's what the planning commission looked at, and that's how they got their determination for the for the fast casual. 
So they did look at the fast food. I mean, yeah, food. that's, that's, well, yeah, that's they, what we're saying. They yeah. did, but I, I thought there might have been there might have been perhaps a. Uh, um, we were discussing the report, and I think that there might have been an assumption that it was uh, assessing it based on fast casual use. Where I think the report might have been specifying that they used the drive, an actual you know drive through fast food, a classification to determine the three percent increase in the yeah. traffic flow. So so uh, so so I think that that's uh, something that we that we had discussed is that you know the three percent increase of. of uh, based on the assessment of uh, it being a full, fully fledged fast fast food drive through, uh, three percent increase in traffic. How about um, the restaurant use is limited to fast casual or comparable as defined by the traffic impact assessment, or equals? Oh, I know where you're going. Yeah, it's kind of like the what we have in number one or. Well, I guess it's kind of difficult to say like a use not to exceed a 3% increase. Well, it's we measure that. because the fast casual is lumpy, you know, it's, it's narrow, but if it's a, a, a fast food restaurant that has um, the traffic that equals to what this study. Right. Like what we care about is the traffic. Is yes. Your point. Yeah. Could you insert fast food, fast casual? It's language. You know, this way, it, it but we, the, the key, uh, and these are all really, really valid thoughts. The key is that we're going to be evaluated. Thank goodness. I mean, you're going to take the time to look at this. Laura's and others are. And, and we're not going to come before the township with something that we certainly uh, wouldn't want to have there or would be detrimental to our neighbors sure. or anxious and eager to have us have someone in there that will help service their needs as well. Um, but I, I, do, I do believe that, again, like David was saying, that this study was done with a fast food consideration and with a drive-through, the implication of a single lane with one bay where you pay to receive was a 3.7% increase in traffic flow, which is benign. I mean, just non-existent. Laura? Um... Would you be able to um, make a determination to, uh, in terms of your administrative review of the zoning compliance with that kind of language? The restaurant is limited to yeah. fast food slash fast casual as defined by et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, um, we would ensure that the, the uh, whatever tenant would not generate more traffic than noted to be able to be accommodated under the conditional use um, review of the traffic impact study. So Laura, with that, do you suggest changes to um, condition one? Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a good suggestion. So right now we still have the restaurant use is limited to fast casual. There's a proposal that add to fast food or fast casual. And, but what you just described, what Laura was kind of talking about, just kind of the traffic impact generally. So could, could, so, we, say, could we say fast casual comma or fast food provided that the traffic does it increase more than 3.7% or something like that? Could we, I mean, like, like I'm looking like at a low volume fast food, no. Laura, is, is that policeable? Like, how, yeah. how would it, you know? Well, I, I, you know, it's not, well, it's only policeable if they provide us accurate data when they request their zoning compliance. Right. And I asked for this information. So that's um, my concern. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that, that's my concern is that, not for I, I I've I've seen cases where traffic studies are specifically did, yes or a, a Tuesday a a Tuesday afternoon when yeah so 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 Mariah or Laura what's the best practice yeah. for including a traffic study some limitation on traffic in a conditional use permit what have we commonly done in SIO what works well. I personally think that the language that you proposed in your motion is good. Okay, I agree. I, okay, I, yeah. All right, Laura, are you okay with the language? Yes. 
So the original language, original being original to when you made the motion. Yes. So not adding the fast food. I think that's what that's, correct. that's okay. what Mariah was just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Correctly. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Is there further comment? Are we prepared to vote on the motion? It appears that we are ready to vote. Let's have a roll call vote. Oh, but maybe you should reread the motion. Sure. Uh, motion by Flintoff, support by Riser, that the township approve CU 23009 Curtis Commercial drive through Restaurant within mixed use, conditional use, based on the recommendation of the Planning Commission with the following conditions, colon. One, the restaurant use is limited to fast casual as defined by the Institute of Transportation Engineers and appearing in the accompanying traffic impact assessment. Two, that either four level two or two level three EV charging stations be installed and maintained. A minimum of two stations are required to be installed at the time the drive through site work is completed. The prep work for any remaining stations would need to be completed at the time a tenant occupies the site. Condition three. Install all signage as recommended by the accompanying traffic impact assessment. Riser? Yes. Hathaway? Yes. Flintoft? Yes. Carey? Yes. Noel? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. That brings us to. New business. Uh, first item is J1, approval of conditional offer of employment to Sean P. McCormick for code enforcement officer position. Um, this is a permanent part time position. I will turn to Township Manager. Thank you. Uh, the um, board have asked me to take a look at um, the code enforcement officer position and look at consideration of having uh, the position in-house as opposed to uh, the way we've been operating for several years. And so we have uh, advertised the position and um, what I would like to recommend is to uh, extend a conditional offer of employment to Sean P. McCormick for the uh, code enforcement officer position. Uh, Mr. McCormick um, worked in uh, Pittsfield Township his entire career uh, in law enforcement and um, understands ordinances, um, has a track record related to community engagement. And so we think he is a good fit for the position. And I think with that, you know, I'd like to have you hear from him and ask any questions that you might have. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I guess to start with, thank you very much to uh, Manager Parker for extending this opportunity to me and obviously everybody on the board for what, having me tonight. I know everybody has a copy of my resume. It is not 100% updated. Uh, that was done when I retired last year. September 11th, I was uh, offered a job with the Washington County Sheriff's Department as a court security officer part-time I did accept it and I have been working there. So that is not on my resume. Those duties are, uh, when you see, walk into the courts and you see the officers in the brown uniforms, when you go through the metal detectors, that's my role. So we greet the uh, customers or the citizens as they enter. We screen their uh, personal property and the person as they enter. We provide courtroom security. Uh, we take uh, people into custody upon the request of the judge or the probation department, and then we secure the buildings at the end of the night and or open them up. So that is what uh, I have accepted a part-time job. It is very flexible. Um, I tell them what days I can work and I get to uh, kind of schedule uh, that way. Uh, so I wanted to let everybody know that I do have that job. Um, I have had the opportunity to discuss that with uh, Manager Parker. I can totally make that job work around Seattle Township and make both positions work. Understanding that this is also a part-time job. Um, I just want to let everybody know that. Uh, again, thank you for having me. A little bit about me and who I am, uh, my history and my uh, experience. As Manager uh, Parker uh, said, 
I started in 1995 with Pittsfield Township as an officer. I rose up through the ranks from officer to detective to sergeant and then lieutenant. As a lieutenant, I held a variety of different uh, positions. I was a rope patrol lieutenant, and then I would uh, oversaw our detective bureau. As the detective lieutenant, I oversaw our detectives, the court officer, the property room, our community resource officers, and it was my responsibility to make sure that the detectives were investigating uh, all of the crimes that were assigned to them, that they're identifying evidence, collecting the evidence, interviewing uh, witnesses, uh, victims, suspects, the whole nine yards, documenting those in, uh, investigations and then presenting them to the prosecutor's office for review and hopefully authorization of charges. I have a career uh, of testifying in courts and I ensured that the uh, detectives uh, were able to testify as well uh, as my role. In 2012 or 2013, I was moved over to the operations lieutenant. And in summary, what that really is, is if you wear a uniform, I oversaw you. So it was my responsibility to oversee six sergeants and 23 officers. Um, I oversaw the day-to-day -day operations, scheduling, payroll, finance. Uh, I was responsible for budgeting our fleet maintenance court master. I wore a lot of different hats in that position. Um, and so I have a lot of experience. Also in the operations lieutenant position, it was my responsibility to do uh, citizen complaints and internal investigations. Oftentimes it was uh, my responsibility to de-escalate situations on the phone with uh, residents calling and complaining about their interaction with an officer. Ensuring to them that I cared, that my chief cared and that if my officers or the officers for the department uh, misbehaved or did something uh, inappropriately or incorrectly, it would be investigated, it would be documented, and it would be forwarded to my chief. Those were standards my chief set uh, to me, and I ensured to residents that, which was honest and believable because I was able to also de escalate situations when people call. Um, and so I would investigate those and then document and forward it off to my chief who would then make the determination on what to do with the officer. And last year I was uh, able to retire, very fortunate under an old program. Uh, so I took that opportunity. That's why I'm no longer there. My education and training for this position, I have a bachelor's degree from Western Michigan University in criminal justice. I have a master's degree in organizational leadership and administration from Concordia. I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy uh, in Quantico, Virginia. I've gone to Homeland Security uh, leadership training. I've got a laundry list of other opportunities that Pittsfield afforded me uh, in regards to leadership and uh, trainings. But I also have uh, investigative uh, trainings. I have interviewing inter uh, interrogation. I have evidence collection training. I have uh, property room uh, management training, uh, photography. I was an accident investigator for the township for approximately 15 years, called in to investigate any serious and or fatal traffic crashes. Um, and all of those circumstances also resulted in me having to testify in court. So that's my training experience and education and to welcome any questions you may have. Great. Are there questions for Mr. Corey? Just you. Sure, yeah, I do, but you I have some as well, but my, I don't have many. <laughs> I'll wait my turn. Well, who would like to just go around? The who room? would like to go first? Yeah, me. You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> um, my questions would be very general. Um, tell us why you would like to be employed with Sayo Township and why you're a good fit for our township. Thank you. So I like a challenge and I, uh, <laughs> no, uh, well, so please, uh, please don't take that wrong. I like that answer. <laughs> well, when you start getting chuckles, I'm not sure. All right. So when I say that, what I mean is this is a new program for the most part, that it needs to be developed and uh, created. And I have experience uh, within my career as in law enforcement uh, with Pittsfield Township. I revamped our whole property room system. I uh, helped create our uh, community resource officers and our uh, 
school resource officer position. So I like the opportunity to take something and create it and see it from the beginning to the end. And so uh, this opportunity is uh, unique. I live in Dexter, so it's very close. Um, I understand code ordinance and enforcement, and I believe in I don't want to say I'm old school, but I like the aspect of being able to go and talk to somebody face to face and say, hey, we have this complaint. Um, how can we resolve it? Mm -hmm. Understanding not everybody wants me to be knocking on their door. I, I totally get it. But at the same time, I would prefer to do a face to face interaction um, with people. Um, and I know that my experience in Pittsfield will lend really well to this role at Seattle Township. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Reiser. Yeah. Um, hello again. Um, full disclosure, I had the pleasure of working with this gentleman when I was an assistant prosecutor from 99 through 2020. So I've known him and his reputation, and I can talk more about that when we deliberate over him. But um, ours, ours um, I think sometimes it's going to be evenings and weekends. How are you with that uh, as a retiree, as a part-time employee? Because that's when the noise comes in or the blight comes in or you know, the, the complaints. So manager uh, Parker advised me that uh, the hours could be flexible, that some could be days, some could be evenings, and some could be uh, on a weekend. I am 100% okay with that. I worked 13 years of my career on an afternoon shift. Um, Dark does not bother me. Um, I totally understand also the aspect of being retired. I am not one that likes to sit around and do nothing. Uh, so being having something to do is sounds great. Also, the flexibility of being able to work some afternoons or how, uh, the weekend will also help me accomplish my uh, commitment to the Sheriff's Department of uh, being able to work at the courts. So final question, did, did Ed Swope work for Pittsfield? Ed, yes, was Ed Swope the ordinance officer at Pittsfield? Yes, sir. So uh, how, how are you gonna like doing that, that dock at that gig? The noise complaints, the blight, maybe zoning, dog at large, barking dog, things of, that are 90 day misdemeanors rather than some of the stuff you used to do. How are you doing with that? Like shift of your perspective of, of, of what you'll be asked to do? A lot less stress. <laughs> Uh, I have no problem with that. Uh, so uh, no, noise complaints in that. Uh, law enforcement typically is the one that handles uh, loud parties and so forth. Um, so I'm maybe need to. We have, so there's, we, have zone, we have ordinances that can be enforced by our code officer or can be enforced by the sheriff's officer and, and the deputies. And so it seems to be a job that nobody wants, but it's a job we need somebody for. In a job, we need somebody who wants to do the job. So are you up to the, the job that the Sheriff's Department doesn't want because it's just a noise complaint? 100% yes. Uh, we'll have to figure out how those get routed to me because those go through Metro Dispatch when residents call, if we're talking one of the same type of thing. Okay. It, it, some may, some may not. Some might come in that during so the day, in, some might, they, they, they might come in a number of ways. If they come into this office, I'd be more than happy to uh, handle the situation and, and try to mediate it. Thanks. I, that's why I have quick point So Sean, it's really good to meet you. You have a, a great resume. I'm really glad that you're interested in the job. Um, I'm really excited about um, the possibilities for a code enforcement program in SIO. Um, the status quo has been completely unacceptable. And thank you, Manager Parker, for helping us um, get to a point where we can hire a person who's really going to have to build the program. So there is very little to start from. Um, the, my, my hope is that we can develop a code enforcement program that's really responsive. Citizens know that when they have a complaint, when they have a question, they call us and it gets dealt with. I would imagine 95% of the time, it's gonna get dealt with with some, a quick call back, some good information and a conversation. I think it's going to be very rare that 
there needs to be tickets or enforcement action, of course, sometimes that does need to happen. So what, what I would say is I would imagine the code enforcement program too, it's really going to be, you know, a, a one part-time person program with the support of the manager and the township attorney when needed and the sheriff when needed. But even like the program design, we need to think about how we get complaints. What I've observed over the last four years is most of the complaints that come into the township, we, we collect, we try to deal with, we deal with them sometimes not quickly enough, sometimes without quite knowing how to deal with them. So some of the more straightforward ones um, that clearly violate a, a code are, are more clear. But right now we get phone calls in uh, most of our complaints are about our garbage provider. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of complaints are about, um, not even complaints, I'd say a concern of, of mine. For example, we have a new sign ordinance we implemented. We don't enforce it all. And so just in terms of the integrity of having ordinances that we enforce, I believe if we have an ordinance, we should enforce it. Otherwise, we shouldn't have the ordinance. For example, the signs up and down Jackson Road, the little signs. The up and down, signs. okay, for all the little signds up and down Jackson Boulevard. Jenny's Farm Market. I mean, I mean, just as an example, you know, all the way to the Pizza Hut that's been burnt out and sitting there for a few years. Um, and I'm not sure why, um, but it should be. Um, so, so what I'm really interested in is the program that you would develop, you know, with support, of the township, but just understanding that I would imagine a very lean process where a phone call comes into Township Hall, they transfer to you, <laughs> you know, something like that. Because what I found is when we say, well, you're gonna need to go on the website, you're gonna need to fill out a form, you're gonna need to write something down. Sometimes that creates so many barriers that people give up. They feel like we haven't addressed their concern and they kind of give up on us. So what, what would you imagine, you know, from, you know, for a code enforcement program, kind of getting off the ground, how the township, that first communication with residents should go? So I think there's quite a, uh, quite a bit there that I would like to be able to respond to. Sure. So in regards to, you said, how would I create one? So there is no reason to reinvent the wheel. There's other local municipalities that have code enforcement programs that are working. I would go and meet with them. Uh, well, first off, I would like to sit down with uh, Manish Parker and identify what your, uh, the township's goals are for this position. What kind of benchmarks you would like to be able to see what issues you're finding, kind of like you described, uh, being able to report it simply and have it followed up and so forth. And then take all that, but then also then go and meet with other locations, uh, municipalities, and just have conversation with them. How are you receiving your calls? How are you documenting the calls? How are you following up? And how are you then <coughs> measuring your, your results? Um, and with that information, you can then compile and put together a successful program, understanding too that as it grows, you may have to tweak. You know, like hey, we thought this would work, but let's try it this way. So, it's a growing program, but it, there is no reason to reinvent the wheel. What you do is you take what works from other agencies and communities, and you apply it for your own community and, and say we like this and we like this, and we're going to use this stuff. And and that is how I would approach it. Uh, you said 95% education in that, uh, and the signs in the uh, roadway in that. I know Ed Swope from Pittsfield Township drove around and collected them all, and because yep. they always got put behind our That's dumpster at the police department, yeah. you know. Uh, now I'm not sure if he sent off a note to the uh, the people saying, "Hey, if you want to come get your signs or behind the dumpster or not." But I know uh, Belinda Kings Kingsley, who was our Code enforcement at Pittsfield did the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Drove around and collected all the signs that were put in the right of ways. Um, you know, that's a pretty simple, straightforward uh, code violation. The other one you brought up would be Pizza. 
that would be a lot more complicated, would require more time, in-depth uh, work, and would result in working with the township attorney and the township board and to get it addressed. That isn't something that's gonna happen overnight. You do have to start documenting, you do have to start sending notification, and you have to then proceed. And each step builds you closer to the court case if they don't comply mm -hmm. with what the township wants. All that though, uh, I think you have to have a program in place. You also uh, had indicated uh, people just want to be able to, you know, one point of contact on this and that. I agree, but I also do think people like to have uh, the ability just to send a, a request in through uh, like an online portal um, because some people just would much rather, rather uh, type it out and send it in. Absolutely. Nonetheless, I think you have to have a program in place in which you can track and log your calls for service. And I call them calls for service because law enforcement, everything we do is considered a call for service. Whether it's a traffic stop or somebody calls us, it's referred to as call for service. That has a number. If you call and say, hey, Jenny's Farm Market has 12 signs out on Jackson Boulevard, that will get assigned a case number, you know, a, a call for service number. And then you can have that number and you can reference in the future if you ever have questions about, hey, whatever happened to this? I would like to be able to provide feedback to you so you know what happened, but if for whatever reason you want to call back in the future and say X, Y, and Z, you could say, hey, we spoke regarding 23-12, right. and I'd be able to pull it up and say, oh yeah, okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. Um, I think that's a great way to document and log and, and track things. Also, by doing that, it allows you to start qualifying or measuring your results. So now you know how many calls within a year you took. You know how many you're able to just, through education and compliance, divert, right? That the problem's been solved. Not everybody's gonna be compliant and some people are gonna, you know, stick their nose up and say, I, this is my property, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. I understand that. At those uh, situations, all the way from the beginning, since you had that number, you start documenting every incident. So whether they're compliant or not, you document. On today's date and time, I spoke with, you know, Mr. McCormick, and he said he would move the trailer by next week. Mm -hmm. I go out and I check next week, and the trailer's moved. That's closed. You know, I might send a letter to him saying thank you for cooperation. This is now closed. You know, any questions, let me know. If it's not, then I'll follow up. Find out why. You know, there always could be a circumstance to why they didn't do it, and then try to get compliance again. But at some point, after X amount of attempts, you do have to then proceed with a citation. Um, but I do concur with you that I, I would much rather be 95% education, get, uh, cooperation with compliance than, hey, guess what? I'm writing another ticket. You know, right. I, those days for me are, I'm not the young police officer out trying to make a whole bunch of traffic stops. Mm -hmm. And Sean, I really like what you're saying about documentation and that's exactly what we don't have right now. So like, we don't have the universe. Like if you came and asked any one of the nine of us at the table, table or seven of us, I guess, tonight, um, who, what, what are our major complaints? You'd have to piece together the story because that's how they come in, right? We've got the web form for the garbage complaints. We've got everything we hear at board meetings. We have everything that Christy and Fran take in on the phone. And then you have the tiny, 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 tiny little number that go to become a written up complaint it, that we've called code violations. So I think it's also the documentation will help us get a, our arms around what our complaints are in the community because we've not been tracking them in one place where we can follow up on them and measure them. So thank you. Trustee Carey. Well, a lot of my questions were already answered. Um, so there's, uh, I have a couple of reports was one of them I, when the, I'm, I'm assuming we used to get reports here and there periodically over once every 10 years or five years or whatever, I'm making a joke, but um, <laughs> you know, to have regular reports would be helpful. Um, and also zoning. So there's zoning ordinances and then the police type of ordinances. Are you, it sounds like you, well, you've done a lot of police work, but what about zoning types of issues? I mean, Pizza Hut would be a good example. 
Yeah, so I would then look towards my resources to draw upon. So the the the, the zoning department, the uh, building department, the township attorney, you know, and nonetheless, it's in black and white, and it says you know what the the zoning ordinances are, and then I can review them, and I can then track down the appropriate resources to ensure that yes, this ordinance does pertain to what is going on right now with pizza and the and the vacant burnt down building or still standing building uh and how can we address it so i don't have prior experience in zoning quote unquote it still though is an ordinance it's written i know how to find my resources to be able to determine whether or not it's applicable that we can use it to enforce what the township wants to accomplish and you thank you and you are already a sheriff uh, de deputy is that what we mm -hmm. for court, oh, court. what was i'm a court security officer court, court security. okay but you you're working with the washington county the, i am employed through washington county okay. sheriffs the washington county sheriff provides security for the courts well in our ordinances um we do have a list of um people that could enforce mm -hmm. um yeah and washington county sheriff is one of them and I have um, experience with them. Okay, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, um, so I've, I've run into where, well, that's not your ordinance. We can't enforce that. Would you be willing to work with the deputies or lieutenant and get clear, because this has been a real issue, get clear on what they're there to enforce and what we, we are to enforce because if they're called in the middle of the night for noise, let's say, and they show up and they say, well, you don't have a noise ordinance and we don't enforce your ordinances. When actually we do have a noise ordinance and it does state in our ordinance that the sheriff could enforce that. Would you be, I'm assuming you'd be able to work with them just like you would work with the zoning ordinance officer or the zoning officer and most definitely, yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. Most definitely, uh, I, and to be honest with you, I would start with their command officer uh, because nothing against the, the road depths. Um, I supervise the officers on road patrol, so I, I totally understand. But if one is saying I can do this and another is saying I can't do this, their supervision supervisor needs to be the one that says, you are authorized to do this and they want you to do that, and we are contracted to provide that service. That would come from their supervisor. So by all means, I could facilitate that conversation with their supervisor, whether it's the lieutenant or the commander, who then would push that down to the road depths. Yeah, or at least just get very clear on what the roles are for everybody, because yes. that's where it gets confusing. Um, and it's frustrating for residents. And then, you know, we have, I'm sure you've heard of the party barns on South Church Road, and we've had a lot of complaints over there. So this is um, some of the things that we hear from them okay. and both sides, but yeah, um, I think that's it. I don't have any more questions. Are you sworn? What? I, think I am, good. so. Sworn. Sworn, oh. Yes, so they are maintaining my certification through the state. Yes, I am called certification through the state. I am not a, I am not assigned to road patrol uh, or deputy status. Deputized. I am deputized, which is why they're maintaining my. I am not going to get pulled to go work the road. I'm deputized. Yes. Okay. So you're sworn and deputized. Right. I am sworn deputized, and they are maintaining my MCO certification. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I'm very pleased to. Um, have you joining us? Um, I would like to make the model motion to produce, approve a conditional offer of part time employment to Sean P. McCormick for the code enforcement officer position. Is there a support? I'll support. Support by Noel. Um, let's call the roll. Did you want any more discussion? I think we did. You have more discussion that you wanted to make? I had one comment. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, as a result of the dialogue. Uh, you commented about how you would meet with Joyce to understand some of what's going on and what the goals were here at the township. I'm wondering if you might also consider meeting with individual board members who are interested in meeting with you. 
just, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, just to get a sense of where they're coming from and what their concerns are. By all means, I'd be more than willing to meet with anybody. When I say I work with Manager Parker, is because my understanding is she is my supervisor. Right. And so That's that is why I, I'm saying I, I'd be working with Manager Parker uh, to be able to get what the board wants uh, accomplished. And so, but I have no, yeah, by all means, if anyone wants to sit down and yeah. have a conversation with me. Yes. Oh, and also, uh, you know, I've shared with um, members of the board that if, you know, once we get the position in place and have the program in place, mm -hmm. Um, I would have the um, code enforcement officer attend our meetings on a regular basis in order to provide uh, a report and an update and ask many questions related to where things are at in reference to code enforcement. I think it's really important to make sure that um, the board members are informed and know what is taking place as well as the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think you know, the program's got to be developed. And yeah. so I know that you and Joyce will work together to get that program drafted up and whether it's a, you know, kind of like, here are the goals of the, here's what we think the goals of the program are. Here's the approaches we're going to be. Just something that we can get in front of us, get us all on the same page. Cause I don't think we all have the same goals necessarily, or at least clarity about our goals for code enforcement. And so it'll be a process. Um, for the township together. And I do, I do want to say that I think for this to work well, like we have to totally have your back. Yeah. Um, and we can do that when we all have the same goals and values. Um, but I do think because we've never had a code enforcement program before, it's going to take, um, you know, some fact finding discussions with staff, our front desk staff, um, our, our fire chief, our utilities team, who's out there always hearing things mm -hmm. and, and kind of pulling together the, the sketch of the community. Thank you, let's call the roll. Riser? Yes. Hathaway? Yes. Flintoff? Yes. Carey? Yes. Noel? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Congratulations, thank you. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Yeah. Yes. This brings us to J2. Would you like to move forward? Not really, but I don't know why. Is it focused on you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, do we? So this is J2 possible action proposal for township network infrastructure refresh. You need a copy of the item. Probably. <laughs> I brought my computer, but I didn't bring my computer with me. Um, oh, my head. Um, right. So when I first got here and uh, started poking around the building, looking at the network infrastructure, I was pretty astound astounded by what I found here in terms of um, where the cabling was located, uh, the cabling used, uh, the... Um, the way things were labeled, lack thereof, the map to tell me where things are at is awful. Uh, the equipment in the server racks is very old and all out of life. The server operating system is near end of life. Um, there was nothing positive I really found in terms of what I was used to or expecting in a modern network. Um, and so it quickly became evident what I thought was making some changes, I didn't see anything worth saving. And so I've been getting numbers to replace the current cabling, which is a CAT 5E standard unbranded with CAT 6E with a company, several companies I've, I've uh, got quotes from people's work I know with professionally installed tested cabling um, that I know is going to be there, replacing the old outdated servers for example, I had a hard drive fail today, um, yesterday, with new minor equipment that is not, you know, the new server we have is six or seven years old, which is very old. Um, with new new equipment uh, that's better 
uh, configured with redundancy for power for disk and such to avoid um, problems and also with more power, backup power, so we don't have situations that we had with the outages over the summer. Everything really does need to be replaced at this point in time. Nothing outside of the laptops I've purchased this since I've been here. All the other desktop computers that people had are all out of warranty, and a lot of those were four-year warranty. So everything here is very old and done. Uh, I guess kind of piecemeal, I suppose, was built part by part, but no real overarching plan. So that's what I have here in this is um, replacing the cabling, replacing the server equipment, um, getting support on the installation. And then we've also included replacing our copier scanner, which is very old. The plastic is yellowing, which when plastic's yellowing, that tells you it is getting there. Um, then there will also be a backup system, for example, uh, one of the BSNA databases got wiped out recently, and instead of me being able to restore it within an hour, I had to contract with our um, our uh, support uh, provider, and it took the entire day to get there, which shouldn't have been that hard, but just because of what they use, I can't get access to it. Um, and then there's software licensing, and um, so come up with about $165,000 in cost to uh, replace the cabling and all the work that needs to be done in new equipment. Um, and for the abatement of the cabling, I talked to the fire department and the Washtenaw uh, electrical inspector and they didn't see anything in code about abatement, but two of the cablers were pretty sure that Michigan law states that you do have to abate old cabling when you uh, replace it. So you have to remove it. You have to get rid of it. You can't leave it in the walls. Um, and then to Jonathan's question about why not just replace, uh, keep the cabling we have and just use wireless. The problem with that is right now our, um, network locations where everything connects are in two separate rooms. One's in that room on the other side of the wall, which is also where there's a water heater, chemicals for cleaning, and a faucet, which uh, over the summer I found was running and it was plugged up. And, you know, it's a horrible, dirty environment for the network equipment. And the other one is uh, in the new section where they keep the buffer. And over the summer when Anna's office was flooding, uh, Steve was getting up on the roof and as he is in the roof in the rain, was coming down, which is right next to all the other network equipment. These are both bad environments. They're very open to people and not lockable. Um, and well, so- Now they're locked. Now they're locked. Well, yeah, they're locked. But, you know, um, we have the, uh, whoever the cleaning company is, you know, they have access to it. The door's left open, the public has access to it. It's an insecure and bad environment for the equipment. And so what I'm, proposing is also moving everything to the server room and getting that built up into an actual server room. So we couldn't really keep the old cabling because we need to move everything anyways to secure it better, at which point we still have to run cables out of there and it wouldn't save a whole lot of money because one, you'd still be running cables and two, um, the new Wi-Fi standards, Wi-Fi 6, I believe, require a, a greater density of access points which is gonna drive up that cost as well. So it could potentially be cheaper, but um, not a whole lot cheaper. And then you may limit yourself to what you wanna do in the future. And given that BS, wireless is great and it's much more secure than it was, but it's still, you know, um, they used to have something called war driving where people get a Pringles can and configure it with some electronics and break into people's wireless networks. And that's still possible because it's not, as secure as a cable, um, so. Chris? Yes. Just be curious. Oh, and you know, the um, <laughs> server rack, uh, the network rack in there, it's held to the wall with wood screws. There's four little wood screws in each of the holes where you should have it professionally bolted to the wall and it's not. And it's, um, again, just astounding to me. Well, the positive is it's still working right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I mean, but it, the day in and day out, I know it's, it's, it's yeah, it's erodes efficiency and effectiveness. Yes. Also, so we're gonna have to lay off Joyce. Right. Here. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And so we well, we have ARPA funds. This is, but we yeah, this is. Saya so was coming around. We're we're um. 
as you can see, we're starting a lot of new things and bringing it up to, yes, and I appreciate your report and all the work you've done. I remember when I asked you to show me around the building and you were having many heart attacks as you were, it is panicking. Um, so thank you for all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, I want to say I've, I've had some time to talk to you about all of this in depth and have a much better understanding. I just want to um, thank you. All of this is really needed. Um, can you, for, for people's, um, the board's benefit, two things. Mm -hmm. One, you talk a little more about um, what you mean when you say to turn the server room into an actual server room. Right. And then the second thing is, um, when are we going to be able to start weaning off of um, NetSmart applied imaging, which was the MSP that we contracted for when Jim Murdy retired right. as assessor slash IT guy? Right. So um, what I mean by a real server room is right now it's in a converted office. There's still the desk and uh, uh, wall cabinets up there. Um, and it's just a little server rack that's on the floor with not much room behind it. So it's impossible to get back there to deal with the cabling issues. There's only a couple of ethernet cables that connect to it, which there should be more and it shouldn't be that unbranded cap I cable. The, um, there's carpet in there, which presents a electrostatic discharge uh, danger to the equipment. Uh, equipment is very sensitive to that if you know, you especially in the wintertime when things get dry, you touch something, get a little shock that can potentially damage equipment. Uh, so you'd have to remove the carpet, put tile in there. You have to get the uh, AC working better. It's still very humid in there. There's something not quite right. I don't know if it's missing a, a condensation pump or whatnot. Um, so moving the desk cabinets, getting a new rack, um, getting rid of the carpet and fixing the um, environment and then all the cabling would go in there and ladder racks would make it, which makes it much more accessible uh, and better. And then we get everything in one, one area with cabling. Right now there's just, like you have this much space between where you plug it into a switch, which you need to get to the network and plug it in down here to get to someone's desk. Well, instead of just having a little cable, you know, the cables there and it's just an absolute mess to deal with as well. So things, um, those are things what I mean by real server room. And uh, what was the other one, sir? Um, potential estimated. Oh, estimated, right. Uh, so I think we could get most of this work done by the beginning of the year. And the other uh, big piece of that, once it's all set up by me and configured and I know everything, that takes um, my need for them away, especially in the backups and the configuration of the Microsoft licensing. And the other part is the Microsoft uh, O3, Office 365 licensing. Right now we get that through them and they get it through another company. And so um, I've been finding that when I talk to other vendors, our pricing we can get directly dealing with them instead of going through uh, applied imaging and then through another company is less. And so we would just take over that license ourselves or I'd work, I'd work with a vendor, a big provider like something like CDW, SHI, one of the big companies to manage those licenses ourselves instead of Kind of going third party and, and save money on that and those are the two things that uh, really prevent us from um uh ending our relationship with them right now and once those things are taken care of there's no need uh to, to have to deal with them anymore okay. Mr. Reiser, do you have questions or comments? no thank you i looked at it and paid attention so i'm gonna vote for this when the motion's made and I'll be supporting it too. I did have a question about mm -hmm. something you said in terms of um, your authority or your access with BSNA software. Mm -hmm. And you said you didn't have full. That's for the backups. So that's the backups. So they use um, a, a system called Dato, Dato or Dato, I can't remember. And it's only sold to MSPs, managed server service providers. And so when I've asked for access to it, they said, we can't give you access to it. Um, you know, it doesn't work for us at all. Uh, so that's what I mean when I didn't have access to the backups. I have access to BSNA. It's just restoring things from backup is what I don't have access to. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Chris, will you be doing this yourself? Um, you... No. Um, a lot of the configuration I will, but part of it will be installation support and configuration as well from these companies that will be uh, providing the equipment. So things like the firewall and switches, they have a lot, a lot of capabilities that we'll want to fine tune for our needs and we'll need um, their support and help getting things configured or new access points and such. So there'll be some some need on their on their part, people who know these things in and out who are certified on them. As well as some general. 50 hours of IT labor. Right, right. And that's configuration of the equipment and stuff. And anything else we may decide we need. I may say, hey, I need you to help me reinstall these laptops or something. You know, we may find some other things that come up that we'll need support on. And somebody had a question early in public comment. This is, in fact, just a budget amendment um, request and authorization to go forward. But again, this will all comply with our procurement policy. A lot of these will be you know, under $5,000, some are bigger ones. So <clears throat> bigger ones will come forward, hopefully on consent for those pieces. Gotcha. Well, oh, that was, um, I was gonna clarify that yeah. because that question did come up. And so I think to a great extent, you know, if it falls at a certain level, uh, we'll get bids or quotes in order to uh, move forward. But I think overall, um, Chris is looking for the approval of the plan so that we can start the process of implementation and we'll work within our procedures and policies. Mm -hmm. yeah, anything that's above those limits, I'm already planning on getting, you know, the appropriate number of quotes for to make sure we're getting the best value for what, yeah. what we choose to do. And, and just to the clarify, cheapest, the best value. Chris, are you looking at um, all of next year to get this done? No, I'm looking, hopefully, um, the biggest part will be getting the cabling, the server room redone. And once that's done, getting the new server equipment uh, in and the uh, network equipment will be a lot less time. So, you know, as soon as the cabling's done, then, you know, hopefully within a month, everything else is done. I would really anticipate getting a lot of this done by the beginning of January and then being able to um, hopefully comfortably move away from our managed service provider sometime in March once, yeah. once everything's uh you know, running well and, and such. And, and I just have to say for, for me too, with the, you know, presidential primary coming up on February 27th, this being a regional early voting site with multiple internet, you know, that we'll need. Mm -hmm. Also the streaming service. There's just so many immediate benefits, not needing to have a staff person here running Zoom, just getting the, it's, it's just important on multiple fronts. So I'm super excited about this. So the, the model motion is to appropriate 165,000 of ARPA funds to General Fund 101 Technology Department for the purpose of implementing the network infrastructure refresh plan prepared by IT Director Chris Bailey. Is someone prepared to make the motion? Riser moves. The move by Riser, support by Terry. Um, all those in, oh wait, I'm sorry, this is an appropriation, so roll call vote. Riser? Yes. Hathaway? Yes. Flintoft? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Noel? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Go spend Thanks some money. Help, Chris. <laughs> right. Go fix some IT. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was going to say. So this, this brings us now to items that were moved yeah. from the consent agenda. Yeah. The first item is uh, item G6. This is the Woodview Commons Development Agreement Collateral Assignment. And um, I would like to turn to our township attorney, Mariah Fink, um, and uh, manager, Parker. And we also have with us a representative from Woodview Commons, and I believe um, available, should needed, be needed, uh, the attorney for Woodview Commons. Great. So this, uh, Joyce, do you want me to start? Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Um, this is a fairly standard request, although I understand that this board hasn't seen something like this before. Right. So generally in development agreements, you each have a copy of the development agreement in front of you. Generally in development agreements, there is a provision in this one. It is on page 17 at the bottom. It's 3.4 and it's called assignment. And it says that until the developer has satisfied all of their obligations under 
essentially under this document, the developer may not assign its rights under this agreement without the prior written approval of the township. So um, the, this developer has, uh, is, is requesting that the township consent to an assignment. Essentially what that is, is that the, the um, when the developer assigns their rights and obligations under the development agreement, this new entity stands in their stead and agrees that they will be responsible for everything that the developer agreed to in the development agreement, which is why generally we just say, sure, that looks okay to us. This particular uh, consent to assignment also has what we call estoppel language in it. And so that language says that the township is agreeing that the current developer um, isn't in default on any of the um, obligations under the development agreement, doesn't owe anything to the township right now, is, com is completely basically up to date for the um, stage that the project is in. Has that been confirmed? That has yes. been confirmed. Yes, that has been confirmed by our engineer, that has been confirmed by our planner, and um, both Jim and I have reviewed the consent to assignment. So we would recommend that the township board uh, approve that. Um, and then were there any questions for me about that? Is there anything you would like to add? Um, uh, only that, you know, in other communities, there are agreements like this where uh, there's a provision for an assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, the uh, township attorney indicates, um, the developer is currently in compliance with the development agreement. And um, based on the uh, lender requirement, that's the primary reason why it's being brought to our attention. Um, the loan amount is substantial. And as a result, the lender wants collateral. And mm -hmm. so that plays a part in the request being made. And I think to a great extent, it also uh, protects the township because of certain conditions that are included in the development agreement that's directly related to the township. And there's some assurance that those uh, provisions will be um, handled in a timely manner. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I should have, thank you, um, Manager Parker. I should also have pointed out that the, the rest of the language says that the township, um, that the township will not unreasonably withhold uh, condition or delay approval. So the understanding when we enter these is that if they ask for an assignment and the assignment looks legit, that we'll, that we'll approve it without giving them a whole lot of- Right, yeah, right, because so. they're right. delay. Right, or delay, yeah. And I think uh, the uh, lender is looking at $92 million for the loan, which is substantial. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No, thank you. Yeah. This yeah. has been very helpful. It was helpful talking to you. Um, it's, this isn't something we, yeah. I had seen yeah. before. And the development agreement wasn't in the package. So, right. so maybe I, for the future, development agreements in the package and spell out what it is, assignment, you know, what DA is. Yeah, absolutely. We learned something new. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, uh, with that, um, is someone prepared to make the motion, the model motion, which is to authorize the supervisor and clerk to sign the attached consent to assign the development agreement for the Woodview Commons developer in Jackson Road, S-O-B-I L-L-C. I would so move. Moved by Riser. I'll second. Support by Carey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for coming, Nico. <laughs> it was nice to see you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for having me. Quick question. May I? Sure. sure. Uh, my big question is this if because it's it's pretty um, it's been approved. Would it be too much to ask if it were signed this evening and I'm able to carry it on with me? There are a million things that go into these construction okay. loans. And I'm, I'm just fine with it. I'm fine with it. Does it need notarization? Yeah, I can notarize it. Oh. Yeah. Sure. You want to hang around? I will. Thank you. Yeah, just hang out. 
Okay, well, Nico, hang out. Uh, we'll try and be quick with the rest of this. Um, so the next item is item. We may not. What? We may not try to be quick. He will. Well, don't no, overpromise. I will try to be quick. Okay. I don't know. I, I can't speak for everyone else. It's um, so early. We have the rest of That's time. right. We're so early tonight. Um, item G3. This is the approval of deficit elimination plan to comply with Public Act 140 of 1971 regarding the East Dell Hybrid Maintenance Fund. And this was prepared by Kirk Flintoff. So I will turn to Kirk Flintoff to introduce this item. Let me give an overview. Or do you want to get right to your question? Well, yeah. maybe my questions, you're, everybody's familiar with this. Oh yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my questions, um, so what happened with this is that when we, um, there was a special assessment for that, Correct. for the bridge and the, sorry, there's bugs in here. Um, and the <laughs> parcel owners in that area paid into this. Um, and they still are. <laughs> and they still are. For how long? Is it 20 years? Is that what I- 20 years yeah. is the term of the essay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then um, money was going in and we knew that it would be maintained eventually it's or um, uh, improved or whatever. It's been maintained. So we've, and- and then we got that big bill. Right, but that's my, that's the thing is that we didn't have enough money in the account because Correct. they did the, all the work, at, you know, and it wasn't enough what was in there. So is this going to happen again? No. So, no, so this this is not going to happen again because it was one big bill and what was it, Will, like $100,000? The commitment yeah, so. from the township originally in 2008 was for $100,000 towards the cost which was anticipated to be 200,000. So about half the cost of the bridge maintenance. Okay. And, and with the, the language of the original agreement, again, why we spent so much time on the CUP earlier tonight is because it wasn't written very well. And so it was fuzzy enough that at the time, interim manager Thompson didn't think we could push back on the road commission enough. And so we realized we needed to pay it. And I think that was right. Yeah. Now, what the board did on May 9th, we took an action that was insufficient, but we paid the bill and amended the budget. We can't amend the budget back to them. So at year end, March 31, there was a deficit in that fund. Right. So what this does, and that's in violation of state law, was one of our audit findings. So this checks one of the things off, but you'll notice in the resolution here, the we would we transfer the general fund the twenty six thousand but then the last be it further resolved is that future revenues recognized in the East Del High Bridge Maintenance Fund to the extent that the revenues exceed fund expenditures if any will be transferred to the general fund up to twenty six thousand so I want to be clear in this resolution we're setting forth the expectation that the general fund will be replenished. Yes, I understand all of that. Okay. Okay. So this bridge will need maintenance or improvements in the future. Who is going to pay for that? Is that us? There's no, there's no, um, there's nothing in this action that looks beyond the original mm -hmm. commitment that was made in 2008. But this fulfills what we did in paying that <laughs> invoice, fulfilled the township's commitment under that agreement with the road commission. Okay. Well, in the future, is this going to happen again? Is, was there an agreement? It goes to 20 years, that's it. And then what happens? So are we going my, to be in the same? My, uh, not, we're not going to be in the same situation of having a deficit. I will observe. We need somebody in charge of this in the township. Okay, that's okay, what I was getting. Be it our township manager, be it the, the roads committee or both. But n no one has been kind of, it's, it's sort of like the bus, you know, contract, these little things need a little more um, TLC. Okay, so if we had a project manager, this would probably fall under the project manager. Well, I think if, you know, if there's maintenance that's required, it, it would probably be handled through some fund related to the township. Uh, what that fund is, I can't tell you okay. at this point, I'd have to do the research. Yeah. I just don't want us to, 
end up having in the future another, another situation like this. Yes. yes, or be, you know, oh, by the way, we're doing this maintenance and it's going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. give it, I, I don't it think that'll happen, but I do think you're right that we should look forward to 2027 or 2028. I mean, it's not too soon to be thinking about what we want to do here for ongoing maintenance. I don't know if the residents there have the appetite for a renewal then or what, but we need to plan ahead. Otherwise, those maintenance costs will fall back on the township. Essentially, the original agreement back in 2008 anticipated that the, the big maintenance, the, the sort of real overhaul of the bridge um, would occur closer to 2028 when the SAD fund had collected all of the money, but they did the work several years earlier and wanted to be paid when they did the work, the road yeah. mm -hmm. So it's, it's now the work that was anticipated in that original agreement in 2008 has been completed. And after that, there was no agreement for what would happen, okay. but you're right. That the bridge is still there and that in, and in the future yeah. it will probably need more maintenance and there's no currently there's no agreement by the township to help pay for that maintenance and this is also a historic district as well right yes so we <clears throat> have to maintain it right isn't that what historic district the uh, no, this is under the county. Or is this a little the, different? The township than, doesn't actually own the. Bridge. We don't have to continue to do anything, but we have just set a twenty-year precedent of maintaining a bridge. Okay, Part, partnering, partnering with the road commission to maintain. Certainly. The so interesting. Okay. All right. That that answered my questions. I just want to make sure that we don't, in the future, are in the same position. Yeah, this is really an easy fix. Um, well, this is something we need to do to yeah. comply with the state to, yeah, to respond right. to the yeah. letter from yeah. the treasurer. So once this right. once this um, goes through, then we'll write up the letter, make the journal entries and the documentation, and send it in. But the and larger the question is something that we should keep an eye on. Right. Well, I think I I do think we need to figure out. I I think maybe as part of the transportation conversation. Right. You know, we need to be right. thinking to ahead here solution, because right. one of the issues with our administering so many SADs is people expect us to. And then once we have, they see us as responsible for. And actually know. under some statutes, depending on the how it's written, some the municipality can be responsible under a statute. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know about this one because I don't, I, I haven't read into which statute they used or whatnot, but um, <coughs> okay. Well, and you know, whatever the township owns or, you know, I mean, we don't own the roads, but if we're going to um, improve them, we need to maintain them. And, and, yeah. and so we've partnered with the road commission to do that. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and um, anything else that we own, pathways, yeah. we have to maintain them. I, I think actually the, if you if we were to go back to the residents about the bridge, if you know in the future we need to do work on it, I think there's still a tremendous amount of support for the restoration of the bridge, and so I think that's you know, there is the fact that it is a historic district. I think is an important thing. Is someone prepared to make the model motion to adopt the resolution to approve the deficit elimination plan for the East Delhi Bridge Maintenance Fund as proposed? I'll make the motion. So moved by I'll Carrie, support. support by Noel. Um, I, we probably need a roll mm -hmm. call for this. Riser? Yes. Hathaway? Yes. Flintoff? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Noel? Yes. Resolution adopted by zero. That brings us to item G5. This is the authorization of rate change for township recording secretary. And you had a question about this as well, well That's so much about what she does. I like her work. Um, what the one thing in this this agenda packet, yeah, the minutes were included uh, <coughs> Thursday or Friday when it was ready. Sorry, um, it's been a long couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, it seems like the minutes show up late. And mm -hmm. could is that, I don't know if that's coming from her or if we have it. It's just not being. Do you, I don't know. But if we, so I've talked to our 
about this. So first of all, I want to be clear that they've always been on time per the law. So eight days, business days. Okay. okay. So before our and before our packet. So um, I've talked with Cheryl and um, she has moved around some clients and has made a commitment um, to get those in as, it did, as we did last time, because that's okay. important to me too, since we're trying to get everything out by Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Instead it's, of Friday or Saturday. That was my biggest song. Yeah. And she's, um, this would be a $25 um, per meeting increase. Um, she does a lot of communities. She has, um, she, I, I've encouraged her to, to train other people. She's done, she's been a zoning official in her life. So she really understands this work. And I think does a very good job of oh, she creating does. a good record, especially for ZBA and planning. Yeah, it's a, yeah, I, I do. I do like. Um, There's an art. Absolutely, she does an excellent job. Mm -hmm. So that was just. Um, She'll probably put that in the minutes. <laughs> right, make, make it charges sure for it that, in bold, that right? Time, board packets. You know, it, yeah, that was my biggest. Absolutely, concern. try. You know, and it's it's you know it's ultimately on me. I will say, you know, do do our best. We've talked about it. She's doing her best. Everybody's juggling a lot everything's always been within the um legal requirements which is also what our rules for to require okay i'm going to support this i would move the amount of motion which is to authorize rate change for cheryl mcguire township recording secretary and to authorize supervisor and clerk to sign contract amendment after approval by township attorney <laughs> so moved by riser support by support carry um, all those, actually, I'm sorry, I think we need a roll call. Riser? Yes. Hathaway? Yes. Flintoff? Yes. Carey? Yes. Noel? Yes. Motion adopted, 5 0. All right. That brings us, unless I'm mistaken, to public comment. This is the time for members of the public to speak for up to three minutes on any matter under the purview of the Board of Trustees. We turn first to those who are present in the hall and then to those who are participating remotely. Trustee Riser, will you again serve as our timekeeper? I will. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm used to having so many more people here, it's weird. Good <laughs> evening, Kathleen Brandt, president. Um, I wish that Trustee Brazo was here because he has very insightful about EV chargers. Um, he talked about the public benefit of that, which was a light, uh, light bulb for myself. Any board members have an electric car or a hybrid? I have a hybrid. Nope. Um, so Trustee Brazil said, and I fully believe him and support this, that EV chargers are not a public benefit to the residents of this township. I have a hybrid. I am never going to one of these chargers and pay three or four times the amount that I can charge my vehicle at my house. It's the public, SIO residents are not going to be using these chargers. It makes no financial sense for the person that owns that vehicle. <clears throat> So to say for the old Panera that the employees are gonna charge there makes no sense. They're gonna charge their vehicles at home. Uh, to say that the new uh, Firestone um, building business, that people are gonna take their cars in there and charge their cars where they're having their tires done makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so what SIO is doing is building infrastructure, building a lot of infrastructure for people that drive on I-94 and other places. We are not building that infrastructure for SIO residents in a real financial way. Mm -hmm. This seems to be the number one priority of the Planning Commission, that everything that comes before them they must commit to putting in EV chargers. We are not supporting the, the infrastructure that we need. All the residents need fire. 
In fact, if you recall from some of the public hearings about um, supporting the fire said, there are people that said, I will not support this because the township does not support me in making adjustment to my house. There was a gentleman that wanted to put a screened in deck in and he was flat out turned down uh, because he didn't have the variance width in the back, which was a wooded lot and there was nothing behind it. So we turned down our residents, um, not giving the same consideration we give to business owners and developers. It was my earlier comment. Business owner comes in here and says, I can't sell this property unless you let me do this, right? It's every developer, every business owner that comes before you and they wanna talk ad nauseum about why don't you make, the, make it wide open for me so that I can make more money. And our residents don't get any consideration for that. And they respond by saying, I'm not supporting a fire millage. Well, actually that makes a good point. If we are not getting contributions for real infrastructure, then we're giving benefit to uh, business owners and developers, and we're not giving benefit to residents where some of that could be taken up by contributions. And I would urge the board to have a frank discussion with the planning commission because they think EVs are the number one thing they should ask for over and over and over again. And they always say, you know, somebody's gonna come here and eat dinner and charge their car. Not if they live here, they're not gonna do that. You have to figure, find out how much does it cost to use these chargers? When you're almost four minutes. I know. <laughs> I got it right here. So it's very expensive to use those chargers. People are only gonna do that when they're transiting and they don't have enough mileage on the vehicle they purchase. So please have that discussion with the planning commission. Thank you. Is there anyone else present who would like to speak during public comment? If no, then let's turn to those who are participating remotely. Right. One person. Yeah, good evening. Hi, Paula. Yeah, how was everyone? I wanted to thank uh, everyone involved in the voting. I think this early voting, it's been, I'm sure, a lot of work. I always feel that the more people vote and are informed, the better our community is going to be. So I know it's been a big effort, but it's gone really smooth, and I appreciate all the effort everyone put into that. And I kind of agree, uh, I don't have any comment per se, but Kathleen's right about those chargers and um, <clears throat> the discussion about fast food versus fast casual, <clears throat> that area wasn't ever supposed to be a, a fast food per se. And you could call fast food by one name of a company. But I think the real issue is we want something other than a drive through. <clears throat> adding to more uh, traffic and um, to be more of a community. So I, I appreciate the discussion you had around that. And, uh, but a great job was what I really wanted to say about the voting. And I appreciate all the hard work involved in that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paula. Paula. Is there anyone else participating? Oh, that's it. All right, and you wanted to respond to... Uh... Yeah, some of these speakers on. Pam has her hand up. Oh, yes, Pam. My, my apologies. I thought I had my hand up. I was like, wait, where am I? Oh, whoops. Um, my, my public comments are a little bit of a mess, so excuse me. First off, uh, Trustee Carey, excellent com uh, questions on the bridge. Supervisor Hathaway, as always, your report was just... Uh, um, had me uh, tied to my seat here, and you you always do such a good job giving your supervisor's report. Um, to um, Sean, 
Um, oh my gosh, welcome. I loved everything, every single thing that you said. Um, our township is like our IT situation. It's a mess. It's a mess. Um, and it's like our, our uh, 10 years, we did not have um, commercial fire inspector. We are so far behind in the times. I Sometimes I wonder if we're still living in the 1800s. So I appreciate what you bring, your background, um, your focus, your, um, your interest, um, and that you're not afraid of the dark. Thank God. Um, Chris, oh my gosh. Um, I, I, I might be a little touchy when you don't change the, the camera to the audience, but I have forgiven you for the next year when you forget because of everything that you've had to go through. Um, and if there's anything that I can do, um, if you, if you need a positive word, you just let me know and I will send you a positive word. Thank you so much for everything you're do, doing and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Is there anyone else participating uh, remotely who would like to come? Maybe Paul, all of my, uh, yeah, he's, he's already spoken. spoken. All right. Still raised, I think. So. Oh no, then you only get one. Yeah. All right. Regardless of how many times you raise. Chris was just being a human being. I know, okay. I know, I know. He's allowed. Um, all right. That's it then. That's it. All right. Just one. I just had one one comment. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, so I did want to say I thought of this earlier um in reports, but I forgot John, but Kathleen's comments reminded me. On planning, again, I saw in the report, again, the planning commission was again spitballing community benefits with developers at the planning stage we didn't that was i just reported out what was in there I, that was i'm gonna cut you off i'll let you go ahead you, you were but someone on the planning commission said those things that was in the uh carlisle wartman report so i don't know how those okay. came to be the benefits so carlisle wartman laura joyce um again I know we had a conversation okay. about meeting with uh, the chair. Uh, okay, the good. The commission to talk about the community benefit. Good. The issue. process. Yeah, the process. Uh, you know, we put together the process with our development review team. So I think we, we just need to meet with her and have that discussion. And okay. Hopefully and, and, and I okay, included excellent. them. Excellent. Because I, I included just, them to put us on notice that they're already talking about them and they may or may not comport with what we want by way of public benefit. Right, and and I think in that, Joyce, if we could get some clarity and if we need to go outside Carlisle Warman to get the expertise we need on EV chargers, like, because other communities are must be dealing with this. So there must be a way to, you know, whether they're a community benefit or not, we, we clearly need more technical expertise and some standards for what we're asking for. Okay, thank okay. you. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Clinton. Support by Noel. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed. We are adjourned. Welcome, Sean. At 953. Congrats. Wait, 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 wait.